Okay. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Safer and Stronger Communities Overview and Scrutiny Subcommittee, July 6th, 2023. Just some brief notes to our visitors and guests. Um, for the benefit of your YouTube users, members of the Safer and Stronger Community Overview and Scrutiny Subcommittee are present in the Committee Chamber in County Hall, Beverly. Officers have also joined us in person. Members, please ensure that all mobile phones are switched off. If the fire alarm does sound, please exit the room via the fire doors, which will be signposted by the committee and manager. Okay, subject uh, the decorations. Members are to declare any interest in the meeting. Have we got any members wanting to clear into? Yes, Peter. Yeah, item two. Um, no, item five, chair, yeah, sorry. Uh, when it refers to um, terms of tenancy agreement, uh, I am a council tenant. Thank you. Nobody else? Thank you. Move on to uh, item three. Oh, sorry, minutes to be approved for a correct record of the last meeting held on the 8th of June, 2023. Can I have approval, please, and seconder? Thank you very much. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shepherd. Must learn how to use microphones. Uh, there was an addition of at the councillor, the council's decamp policy. Would it be possible to see a copy of that? Because we didn't see that at the time. It wasn't on the minutes. To do with the uh, damp and mould policy, it was a link at the end. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Shepherd. Much appreciated. Okay, we'll move on to item three. Nobody's got anything else to come up with. And we've got the uh, presence of the Humberside Police update here. And we have presence of Assistant Chief Constable David Marshall and Chief Inspector Derek Hussein, which will lead to the proceedings, I believe, Chief Inspector. A quick question for you while you're in your position. Can we call you Derek and can we call you David? Is that all right by the members of the public? Absolutely great, thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, uh, councillors. Thank you for inviting us here this morning. Um, really pleased to be here. Um, very briefly, my name is Dave Marshall. Uh, I'm Assistant Chief Constable. Um, I'm recently appointed the force lead for neighbourhoods and communities, which looks after local policing and neighbourhood policing, amongst other things, including control room. So a good tactical oversight of the force and operations. There is a caveat to that, though. I do cover the entire force, so I do not know absolutely all the nuts and bolts of every crime that's committed. People always ask me about individual crimes, so apologies if I don't know the specifics of something, but we will certainly try our best. So if I can walk you through the agenda, Chair, I'd be grateful. Um, first and foremost on the agenda, then, is details of crime and statistics in the East Riding area and activity across the um, county. Um, there is some data within the agenda pack that was circulated, but if you'll allow me, I will go through some of that in a little bit more detail and put some context around it. Um, my colleague, uh, Derek Hussain, uh, Chief Inspector for Neighbourhoods for East Riding, will probably bail me out at some point as well, but we'll do a little bit of a double act as well. I'm not going to tell you who's the straight man, you'll have to guess. Um, so, on to the, the crime. If I can explain our processes, really, and what the baseline means. So, in the pack, you'll notice there's two sets of figures. One relates to the year ending 22-23, uh, it's financial year, uh, and one ending 18-19. The reason we've got the 1819 data in there is because part of the government and national crime measures, we're using that as the baseline to uh, to understand what the movement of crime is. The reason for that is uh, obviously that was the last year before COVID. And we did see during the COVID years and subsequent years after, as most public services did, including NHS, significant changes in their demand profiles. So it's been nationally decided that the baseline 1819 represents a average previous year baseline of normality for us to compare stats to. So that's why there's two, two baseline figures in there. So if I go on to the, the data itself, 
Um, in total, there's been a 16% increase in crime compared to that 1819 baseline across East Riding uh, in the last year. And I'll try and break that down into a little bit more detail. Um, there's been a slight increase in violent crime uh, of 18.9%. The context of that is that approximately 40%, 40% of all, all recorded violent crime is domestic related. So that is offences that are going on behind closed doors between partners, ex-partners. And that's quite a staggering statistic. And clearly our impact on that, it only comes to light generally when it's reported. It's not something that's in the street that affects people passing by. So it's very, very difficult to actually find those offences unless they're reported directly. In addition to that, and we'll talk about Vogue, violence against women and girls later, but about 28% of all crime, all crime committed is violence against women and girls, whether that's stalking, harassment, robbery offences, theft offences, etc. But they're offences that affect women and girls. So just over a quarter of all offences, and nationally we're about an equal with national statistics, but that is increasing. Uh, and I, I've no doubt very soon that will probably be around 30%. The next item on the agenda is sexual offences, uh, a slight increase uh, of those of 10%, that's 61 offences in total uh, in the last year compared to the baseline. Uh, and again, in terms of trends of sexual offences, we are seeing an increase in reporting of historic sexual offences. Um, we have what we call acute offences, which is those that are happening here and now within the last 24, 48 hours. Historic, which is up to three months old, and then, uh, sorry, um, recent, which is up to three months old, and then historic, which is older than three months. Mm -hmm. And what we are seeing generally is an increased confidence of people reporting historic offences, so things that have happened in the past. Indeed, we've had offences that are 50 years old being reported to us recently, such as the impact on the victim that they've kept it themselves all that time. Um, we've seen a, a reduction in robbery uh, of eight offences or 12%. Robbery figures are reassuring the low for the, for the county. Uh, and again, we've seen a significant decrease in burglary down 671 offences or 42.5%. Uh, vehicle offences, again, we've seen a reduction of 320 offences or 34% on the baseline. Yeah. Theft from person has seen a 70% increase, which does sound a lot. Um, and that's a total of an additional 28 offences. So uh, 68 offences as opposed to 40 against the baseline. Yeah. We've seen a 78% increase in shoplifting. Um, and again, I think the context around that is the current cost of living crisis. We've seen people struggling um, and we do tend to find a change in what is actually being stolen from goods that people are going to sell on, which is traditional, such as batteries and high value goods, razor blades, etc., to more things that people are going to use for their own consumption, such as baby fuel, sanitary products, basic food items. So we have seen a shift in not only the, the number of offences, but the actual amounts and um, type of property being stolen. And then all other offences have been an increase of 228 offences on the baseline, which is 17%, just over 17%. The big one there increases crimes against society, which is lots of things. So that's things like malicious communications, uh, indecent images being sent, etc. And again, to put that in context, that is um, people who are sending images to each other. Um, but it also may be what we call sextortion frauds. So effectively someone may be on a dating site or on Facebook, uh, they get a friend request from somebody, they do chat for a while, then they will get asked to um, send explicit, explicit images or undertake sex acts, which they comply with. And then soon after they'll get demand for money saying effectively that we've got pictures of you now doing things that you shouldn't be. And we'll send them to all your Facebook contact friends if you don't send us X amount of money. So we are seeing a massive increase in those kind of offenses, um, up to eight offenses a month of that description. As you can imagine, really hard to stop. We've done lots of media campaigns, etc. Um, but but most of the offending is based in the internet land. So a lot of it, we believe, is overseas um, through various VPN networks. Very difficult to trace. Fortunately, not members, not that many members of the public do actually send money. They tend to contact us. Um, but I'm sure that's to provide the iceberg. I'm sure many involved don't because of the embarrassment of the offending nature. Um, and we do also get indecent images of children swapping images between yes. themselves. So effectively consenting children. So people 15, 16 sending each other images. Um, however, they are classed as children. So it is classed as indecent images um, between children. And interestingly, technically, the child that sends a photograph of themselves is committing an offence. 
of sending a decent image of a child because they cannot consent at their age to sending that image. So it's quite a collective mix of offences in there, but I think that probably hopefully gives you a flavour of what we see in some of the increases in. I will pause briefly there. I know there's time for questions at the end, Chair. Would you like to do them at the end or? You've had enough, David. <laughs> Thank you very much. I do have a couple of questions from the Chair before I move everything to the floor. Uh, and the first question I've got is for, for both of you, really, is uh, uh, update on the appointment of the new Chief Constable. Have you have got anything to uh, give us on that at the present? So thank you very much. So um, Mr Anderson, our Deputy Chief Constable, uh, applied for the job. He went through the selection process. Um, we had an external um, stakeholder panel. I think it was about 35 stakeholders involved in that. Um, several press um, type uh, media exercises to make sure that he's, uh, he's suitable to be let loose on the media, um, presentations and an interview. And at the end of that process, a recommendation will be going before the police and crime panel, I think on the 14th of July, as the pre preferred candidate. And if successful, then he will replace Mr Freeman um, at the beginning of August, beginning of next month. Thank you very much. Um, anybody got any questions for David on that first? Uh... Yes, please, Barbara. Yes, David, uh, I have two for you. Um, this one is um, safeguarding domestic violence abuse. And, and you mentioned that, and you mentioned that, um, that domestic violence is a huge part of violence statistics. So I read this report, um, which was allowing for we protect. Have you heard of that? It's we protect. It's an app, and it accelerates access to the civil legal assistance and protection for victims of domestic abuse. This was in our magazine, our uh, East Riding magazine, and I read it and thought, well, that's interesting. It's been trialled down south of England to apparent success, and it's. It's a frontline app for officers to allow them to, to have instant access to civil legal support and protection for those who need it most and saves a lot of police time with waiting with the domestic um, victim, particularly in hospitals and things like that. That, that's, that was my first question. Have you... It's supposed to have been um, part of the safeguarding tools for domestic abuse, and it was um, it was apparently accessible to all homicide frontline officers across the force from the twenty second of May. And I was my question is how is it going? How are you finding it? Is it effective? Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'm not aware that we do subscribe to We Protect. There are a, a vast number of applications that are available from third party suppliers that are pushed nationally. Some of them are victim orientated, so you can download an app on your phone. Um, some of them are very good. For instance, by shaking your phone, it will automatically phone the police. Um, it will automatically then start recording as well. Um, and some applications have res, um, repositories for you to um, maintain uh, all digital evidence secure. So if someone sends you text messages, etc., you can move into a file. There are a plethora of these, these number of applications around. Um, what I would say is though that we do have our own systems now, our robust systems. Clearly there's evidential requirements about the information that we, we gather in terms of making sure it's legitimate, it hasn't been tampered with, and making sure that uh, all the transaction of that material is auditable and there's a clear chain of evidence through from the officer attending, ga gathering that evidence to it going to court. So we do have uh, our own evidential processes in place. Clearly, the criminal justice system needs a certain elements, so they will mean to have formal statements taken. Um, there has to be certain disclosures undertaken as well and certain forms. So although we don't use We Protect, um, we do do all the evidential things that you would expect. And we are constantly building our systems and processes and investing in technology to improve. All our frontline staff have something called Pronto, which allows them to put crimes on remotely so they can sit in a hospital or something like that and update crimes, take statements, etc. Uh, and do what we call dash domestic abuse, um, safeguarding uh, referral forms as well. So all the things that 
many forces can't do already that we protect would be really good at. Um, a lot of that functionality is already embedded within our systems. Thank you. Thank you very much. The second one is mental health. Um, and apparently it's um, considered that the police time is not wasted exactly, but a crucial amount of police time is taken up waiting with mental health uh, victims and, and patients in hospitals around. And so there is now, uh, Sir Mark Rowley has rolled out a particular um, situation called Right Care, Right Person. Yeah. And uh, this allows the police to take a back step and allow others to take over. And uh, my question is, since it's been around since May 2020, can you give us an update on how effective it is for our area, how you're finding it, whether it's working for you? Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure our new Chief Constable, Mr Anderson, will be really happy that you've asked that question because it was his idea was right care, right person. Um, I, I don't know if you're aware, but Homicide was actually the, the um, founding force, the innovative force that actually produced the policy document and introduced it, um, as you say, back in 2020. It was an incremental increase, gradually withdrawn from certain events, so there wasn't a cliff edge, which has been a lot of the issues in the media about Sir Mark Rowley when he mentioned this uh, as a, a an issue. Uh, and the fact that he, he was only given six, eight weeks notice. Um, it was introduced in homicide over a two year period, incrementally to give other services time to build their capability and capacity, which was the main thing. Um, so we, we like to think that we are leading in homicide and indeed the Met and nationally, the College of Policing is now adapting our doctrine and our framework um, and toolkit as the national best practice. And we are assisting them and we have had virtually every force in the country come and visit us to go through the toolkit and understand how it works, how we implement it and about our memorandums of understanding with our partners. So it's been a massive success. Um, we we think we save, we think we save because obviously mental health is, is, is lots and diverse. Um, but our initial data shows that we save approximately a thousand hours of office time a month. Now, if you think uh, an officer works about 40 hours a month, so it's about 8.5 equivalent full-time officers a month that we're saving time. That does not mean, though, that we don't attend mental health incidents. Um, we do attend mental health incidents if there's a risk to the public, if there's a risk to the individual. But the vast majority of that, things that we were attending previously um, was people in crisis um, and no other service was, was turning up, I'm being brutally honest. Um, and we were filling a gap caused by other agencies because of their lack of capability and capacity. Um, now, people say, well, that's the right thing to do. And yes, it is. But unfortunately, my officers aren't trained in mental health. Um, it's a specialist skill, a specialist set. And what we found is that often, um, I don't know if you've heard of trauma-informed practice, but by a police officer turning up and deal with someone stigmatises the mental health that can make someone's condition worse. And if if they are ultimately become violent in front of police officers, there's a tendency for, them, for their own protection to be handcuffed not committing offence, but they handcuff for their own safety. So again, it can have quite a traumatic impact on that individual uh, and make their condition worse. So in the vast majority of instances, policing is not the right agency to actually deal with mental health. So again, our pioneering approach has, has reinforced that. But it's not just about mental health um, is right care, right person. It incorporates a range of issues that we used to attend and, and deal with. So for instance, someone may phone, a hospital may phone and say, Somebody who has arrived um, asking for treatment, uh, they've, we've put a cannula in them to give them some drugs um, and they've been here eight hours and they said the board of waiting and they've now left. Can we report them missing, please? Now, I don't think that person's missing, to be perfectly honest with you. I think they've left hospital because they've been waiting eight hours for treatment. Um, they're not necessarily missing. You would not, you would not believe how many calls for service that we had in the past for things like that. So it's been sensible and proportionate about how we respond and putting the onus on other agencies to actually deal appropriately with things that are in their their remit and, and their care. Thank you very much. Have we got anybody else? Um, hi there, and thank you for coming. Really appreciate it. Um, just to really cut it relatively new to this, new to the committee, things like that, and, and looking through the data, um, I noticed that you you sort of you gave you've given us raw data, and I did a couple of calculations and percentages myself, you know, just for old time's sake, practice the maths. 
would it be useful to look at in terms of the data, look at those percentage changes and provide them? Because you, you were telling us that we were going along, and it's much easier for us to analyze at that point. That, that just, just one point there. And also, just, just looking through, there seems to have been an increase uh, in more kind of more violent crimes, I suppose, crimes against individuals as opposed to robbery and things like that. Is that because of retrospective reporting, or is there another reason behind that? So on the first question, um, I don't see any issues why we can't break the data down. There's nothing confidential in it. So yes, I'm sure we can sort that out. So Derek, Derek is scribbling furiously. So thank you. Okay. Um, just in respect to violent crime, um, violent crime does cover a multitude of offences, things that most people may not actually interpret as violent. So public order offences. So if you've got two people in the street shouting at each other, being quite rude, um, and someone witnesses it, that is a Section 5 or a Section 4 public order causing harassment, alarm and distress. Under the national guidance, that is an offence. So that will record and categorise in the violent crime. So um, what I would say is that not all violent crime means that someone's been assaulted, first and foremost. Um, the, the second bit to that is that, you know, we, we do have an increase in domestic abuse. And I can't, I can't butter it up in any way, shape or form. It, it is a significant issue. I will talk about it a little bit later in the agenda, if that's OK. Um, but it's a real challenge nationally. Um, and the question is, how can we... Um, support victims better? How can we get the cases through um, the courts? Because ultimately, often, um, these cases are uh, one person's word against the other within the confines of a house. So it is very much about collecting evidence and presenting that evidence to the court to persuade the court that the offence has been uh, committed. And also, it's about the rehabilitation of people, isn't it? Because, as we know, a lot of people who commit domestic violence and violent offences, um, there is some underlying issue there, whether it's drugs and alcohol abuse, whether it's um, going back to financial difficulties and things like that. There is, you know, underlying causes for it. So it, it's got to be a full multi-agency approach. And, you know, the police alone can't solve this. We can arrest people and put them before the courts, but ultimately that doesn't resolve the underlying issues often. Brilliant, thank you for that. Anybody else? Are you want to go, Peter? Thank you very much. Um, the next section I've been asked to report on is the performance of our control room, effectively. Um, and this is in relation to our success uh, or not at answering 999 and it's actually 101 calls. Please, please don't phone treble one. That's the ambulance um, on the document. Um, so we, we get a substantial number of, of 999 calls. You can imagine every day we get between five and 700 calls a day coming in for 999 and a similar number on 101, which is our non-emergency number. So generally between 1400 and 1600 calls a day come through our control room for a multitude of things, as you can imagine. So on 999, promptly, obviously, that's the emergency number. Um, our average speed of answer is seven seconds. So I don't know if everyone's aware of the process of 999 calls coming in, but uh, someone will phone BT, they'll request police ambulance or fire service or Coast Guard. That is done through a central BT hub. There are a number of hubs around the country and they will then transfer that call to the, the local force. So that call then comes to us. Once that call's presented to us, we've got then 10 seconds to answer that call. Now it's not quite as it seems. What that 10 seconds means is that the BT operator will pass the call to us and then they will wait until they're happy that there's a connection going between the caller and our operator. And when they're satisfied, they will class that as finalised and closed and that's their handle time. So that's included within that seven seconds. So our average answer time is seven seconds. The national target is 10 seconds. We answer approximately 84% in the last month of those within the 10 seconds. And we have an abandonment rate of about 0.17%. So about 17 calls in every thousand are abandoned or disconnected before they come through to us. Um, you may notice if you've got the data over the last 12 months, a slight decline in performance of the last three months. We were really struggling to understand this um, because we've seen a massive surge in 999 calls over the last three months, predominantly in the last two months. Um, and it's a national phenomenon and we were really struggling to understand why. Um, and I think we found the answer. Um, for those that have got an Android phone, which is powered, um, usually Samsung, um, Samsung uh, update or Android put an update out about two months ago, which means that if you press the side button on your phone five times, it will automatically phone 999. 
Um, so nationally, we've had a phenomenal number of 999 calls, which are essentially probably pocket dials, people going about their business with this button being pressed. To put that into context, the busiest day previously nationally for 999 calls was 140,000 that had been received, and that was a New Year's Eve about two years ago. Um, over four days in the last month and a half, we recorded over 160,000 calls nationally. So you can see the additionality that this has caused us. Samsung identified this and there's been a fix put out. You may have seen it on the national media, um, which resulted in the uh, a dramatic decrease. So we've actually seen about a 20% decrease in the 999 calls that we've been receiving over the last seven days since that started rolling out. So clearly the volume of calls coming through does affect how quickly we can answer uh, and how quickly we can process those calls because clearly we can only answer so many calls at once, although we do move resources around our control room to meet demand as best we can. So going on to then 101 calls, um, our average time to answer calls is 19 seconds. Our target is 30 seconds. Um, there is no national target um, for 101 calls, but we, we set ourselves a 30 second target and we answer 84% of those, just over 84% of those calls within 30 seconds. And our abandonment rate for those after that 30 seconds is just over one and a third percent, 1.13%. 1.31%, apologies. And I'm happy to take any questions, Chair, if you wish on that. Thank you very much for that. This Samsung, I've never heard of it, to be very honest. I must be honest. Uh, and we got any questions for this moment in time? I do have a, one quick question for you. Is um, How will the Humberside Police plan to maintain some the same standards and need for continuous improvement, especially with the advent of a change at the top and that? Thank you. Um, as someone who looks at these figures on a daily basis um, across all our crime performance, um, all our control room, we are really data rich. And I'm constantly looking at ways we can improve. Um, in policing, if you stand still, you're actually going backwards. Um, as you're aware, um, as a force, we were graded as the, the highest performing force in the country on our last inspection, which was in June last year. Um, and we're really keen to maintain that, not because we like to say it, although it's nice, um, but ultimately because hopefully we're providing the best service that we can possibly to yourselves and, and your constituents and members of the public. Um, but we need to keep improving because every day we do know that people do phone up and I can get through as quickly as they want to. Um, so my challenge to my control room chief superintendent is to make sure that we're as efficient and effective and we're monitoring and looking at ways we can improve service. Um, I've been in I've been in charge of this portfolio now for three months, took over in March, having been previously the, the uh, assistant chief constable heading specialist command. Um, it's been really interesting, um, but already I'm identifying with the team around me that there's ways we can improve our call handling uh, and, and the, the customer journey through the process. And we are instigating that. Some is technology, some is our own processes as well. But um, please, I just want to reiterate that everything that we do is geared around that victim journey and how can we make that better? Thank you. Anybody got another question? Can you move? Okay, over to you, David. Thank you. Thank you. So um, Derek may want to come in at some point on rural crime and prevention because he, he heads the rural crime uh, task force. Um, so he's the expert on it. But we we got a, a disproportionate amount of information here. And I'm conscious we're quite short for time, but really happy to discuss it with any individuals after or, or submit a further report. Um, but as, you, as you're aware, rural crime, particularly in these riding, is a significant concern given the rural nature of the communities and particularly the farming community. Um, and we do understand that rural and wildlife crime is a, is a concern. Um, you will be aware that we've invested in a rural, uh, rural task force, uh, made up of a number of officers um, across the force, but predominantly a number of them based in the East Riding. Uh, and through Operation Uplift, which saw a number of new police officers come into the service, we are constantly investing more resources into rural crime. Indeed, I think we've had three officers new officers posting into that specific task force to improve our capacity and capability. Their priorities uh, are around um, acquisitive, acquisitive crime. Forgive me, it's really often the police officer not being able to say acquisitive. Uh, acquisitive crime, this includes things like GPS 
uh, machinery. Um, most of you from the farm community will be aware that the amount of GPS and the cost of it on tracks and farm equipment is disproportionately expensive, many thousands of pounds. So that is a challenge for us nationally. Um, livestock thefts as well, particularly when we see fuel prices go up as well, rural, rural su supplies of fuel uh, and bunkered fuel on farms tends to be targeted as well as heating oil in locations. Uh, equine crime as well uh, and criminal damage, particularly that instigated through things like hair coursing um, and uh, poaching. Um, we do see lots of damage of, of crops, which clearly has a disproportionate impact. And also heritage crime. Um, we are fortunate that we don't have a significant issue with, with heritage crime. Um, pre, prior to coming to Humberside 18 months ago, um, I policed in Norfolk, um, the most churches I think in any county in the country. Um, uh, heritage crime is a real significant issue, particularly around lead thefts from, from old remote churches. So we are aware of the impact that heritage crime can have, particularly around churches and places of worship where there's so much history is invested from local communities and it is the centre of those communities. Um, in terms of wildlife uh, crime priorities, clearly poaching and hair coursing is significant. Not only do you get the trespass on people's land, but you get the damage and the impact as well to crops, um, but also the criminality that comes with it. Because if people are hair coursing, they tend to steal things as well when they're on land and, and, and travel through through the area with impunity. Um, birds of prey crime as well, poaching uh, of eggs and, and killing of birds of prey. Um, badger crime as well, uh, and bat crime. So the full mix of everything from stealing tractors and GPS to um, bats, um, everything that our team covers. The, the staff are trained um, and experts in wildlife legislation, um, and we undertake a number of initiatives throughout the year on a rolling basis. Clearly, um, poaching and hair coursing is, is not a summer event because the crops are too high. It tends to be more in the autumn and winter. Um, so they do follow effectively criminality through the seasons as well and focus on individual types of criminality um, as, as the year progresses. Um, but in terms of acquisitive crime, a number of operations taking place throughout the year, including Operation Swift, which is roadside vehicle checkpoints, checking plant and machinery coming through as well to make sure it's legitimate or legitimate in the right hands. We've also upskilled our control room staff to understand the importance of rural crime. And we also have what we call pop-up boxes. So if someone reports an offence that may not seem like a big issue, it might be quads driving down a country lane in the middle of the night. So it might not sound like crime in action. We've got uh, a technology pops up to say, actually, this is a local priority. It's a local issue. Um, deploy some staff and, and make the rural task force aware. So we're trying to gain that intelligence and, and make our deployment smarter. Um, raising public awareness of crime as well in rural areas. Um, there's a lot that can be done to secure uh, rural premises and use of technology as well. So we are encouraging that. And I'll go on to some of the stuff that we're doing as well through some funding that we've received um, and also involved in partnerships with Farmers Union, etc., National Farmers uh, Union uh, and other local groups as well. Um, I've got lots of information that we can go through, but clearly we've got limited time. But Again, myself and Derek are quite happy to talk to individuals after, or indeed give a synopsis uh, of some of the work that's ongoing. Um, anybody got a question to ask on Go ahead, please. David and, and Derek, when we look at Yellowfin, because Derek, you've, you've brought us in a lot on your sessions about the Yellowfin, the, the motorbikes, so on. Um, my question is, when you've got a single rider on those bikes at night, uh, although they've got night vision and they've got two-way radio, et cetera, and they are chasing some culprits, let's say hair, hair coursing, and they're surrounded, what protection do they have? What do they have access? Is there to um, a vehicle that's nearby? Because they're pretty isolated on their own and pretty vulnerable just one person on their motorbike in the wee hours of the morning up against a gang of poachers or hair courses? Thank you. So Oper Oper Operation Yellowfin, uh, for those that don't know, is, is our motorcycle um, response effectively to, to mo motorbike-enabled crime, particularly antisocial behaviour um, and stolen motorbikes. Um, we have a number of bikes that we deploy with specialist riders who are trained to obviously ride those vehicles and bikes. We, we don't tend to deploy them single crew, so there will always be a number of them together and they will, will work in concert because clearly if you're in a rural area pursuing or following a, a, a bike, 
you've got to try and get ahead as well as being behind because actually we want to stop them we don't want to have a pursuit we don't want to be following people because that puts members of the public at risk it puts the officer at risk and probably the lowest on my list but in reality i've got to consider the risk of the person who's trying to escape so all these considerations so we do try and get ahead um officers who are on those bikes um have all the equipment that you and i and, and derek carry so they have all the sa personal safety equipment handcuffs etc radios um and support of the team around them as well um the bags that we've got are not particularly suitable for pursuing so the the elephant bags that we use are more for antisocial behavior for disruption and in information education however as an organization we have invested in uh, and about to hopefully take delivery soon of some quite powerful off-road bikes i can't remember what they're called forgive me i'm not a motorbikeist um but they are significantly the hybrid bikes that can be used on the road and off-road um, and that will give us a specific what you would class as a pursuit capability so specialist riders with specialist pursuit training able to intervene if necessary so that hopefully will be deterrent for some of these crimes as well because as we've seen in some areas of the country such as the met the Met police we've seen a lot of uh, motorbike enabled crime where people go around on bikes pinching mobile phones or committing robberies um and there, there was a, a little bit of a phase where they would take the helmets off and drop them because the guidance was such that if you know they were putting themselves at risk and if they didn't have a helmet there was the human rights issue and risk to the individual so police couldn't pursue them that's not the case everything's got to be risk-based clearly if someone's got uh, if i know who somebody is on a bike and they haven't got uh, insurance we're not going to pursue them we'll just go around to the house the next day knock on the door and deal with it it's not worth the risk we've got to be realistic and proportionate if someone's riding they've just committed a robbery and they've got a knife on them or a gun on they're threatening the public and they've got no helmet on then clearly we are going to pursue them because that's a different item we've got to protect the public but all everything that we do has got to be a balance um, of risk to the public the individual and the officers um so that's how so people do think that we won't pursue people on bikes we will as long as the circumstances justify it, it's proportionate. Thank you, David. Has anybody got anything else to do with um, air coursing? I'll just throw a question to you then, please, for your next update. Um, hotspots and areas in East Riding with, um, related to antisocial behaviour and how are we combating to preventing the youth in the antisocial behaviour pattern that's going on at the moment? I'll leave it that way. Thank you. Now, Derek has got some data, I think. Um, I, I actually, it may surprise you that antisocial behaviour has been on a glide path um, nationally and in homicide uh, redu to reduce. Um, we do see a change in nature of antisocial behaviour. Um, and I think it's really important that we set out the criteria of what antisocial behaviour is, because it is very subjective. Um, and some communities are more tolerant of antisocial behaviour than others. And if I can give you a quick example, if I may. Um, if I go into the supermarket and I see six or seven people in their mid-60s stood talking to each other, there's not many people who would think that's antisocial behaviour. If we flip that round and that's suddenly a group of 14-year-olds stood outside the supermarket having a chat, is that antisocial? Is it perceived as such? So I always have to put a caveat on because I know from my own bitter experience, as I've got older, stuff seems to be more antisocial than it did when I was younger. So I think there's an element of perception of what antisocial behaviour actually is and our tolerance of it as we get old and some older, I should say. And some some communities are more tolerant because of the expected levels. Uh, and I know in the report, and I, I did notice in the whole Daily Mail's report about Beverly being worse for antisocial behaviour than, than Brand's home and things like that. Um, if that's the perception, that's something that we need to deal with. Um, but I suspect the tolerance level for antisocial behaviour probably in Bransome is slightly different to Beverly. I may be wrong, but there's a context behind a lot of this data, and I think it's really unhelpful just to go on headline numbers. But as, as Derek and the team will allude to, there's lots of work ongoing. Clearly, a lot of the issues that stem from antisocial behaviour uh, often, is, especially young people, is lack of facilities and that may not be an excuse, but it could be an explanation as to why we see people hanging around street corners, et cetera. So, you know, again, we can deal with the symptoms of antisocial behaviour as a police service when they acquire, but it, it has got to be a partnership approach with yourselves, local authority, town councils, et cetera, to make sure that we do provide those facilities as best we can for those young people. Now, there are always going to be young people that decide that they don't want to be engaged and they want to be antisocial. So that let's not pretend that those don't exist because they do and we will deal with those but there are a number of 
children, young people around that are, are just bored and will hang around. And um, if I look back to when I was young as well, um, idle hands sometimes can go off rails and we can break bottles and maybe do things that we wouldn't normally do as respectable young people because we're bored. So I think it's incumbent on us as societies to make sure that we're not just abandoning uh, people, that we are supporting them and giving them options um, such as, you know, youth clubs, sports facilities, etc., and, and parks, etc. Um, and again, I, I do get quite often comments, um, and believe it or not, I, I will quote from Norfolk, so I, I won't I won't breach confidentiality of anyone here, but I used to frequently, as the division commander for a lovely little town in North Norfolk, get calls about some antisocial children playing football in the park uh, on an evening and how antisocial that was. Well, I'd actually quite enjoy children playing in parks and not sat on their Xbox in the bedroom. So there is a balance. But in terms of the question hotspots, we are really keen to hear where there are challenges. Clearly, we've got powers if we need them, but actually often it's about education, going down, speaking to people, understanding what the challenges are. Um, and if that doesn't work, then we can invoke powers and, and work as a partnership. But the vast majority of in instances and the hotspots that we've got are, are reasonably low level and early intervention is suff suffice to at least disrupt uh, or change behaviour. Okay. Thanks, boss. Um, yeah, I guess it's just giving some reassurance as well around how I, as Chief Inspector for neighbourhood, track those processes. Um, every two months, I hold a meeting called SERP, Safer East Riding Partnership, where Nigel and Matt and, and Jeff also on the, on, the, on the panel here, just ensuring that we're doing everything we could in terms of partnership working and reassuring you that I've got the oversight of those hotspots. You know, we talk about Grove Hill area, the Fleming Gate area, ensuring, you know, I've got some funding in terms of, of SERP, ensuring that our partners, if that is what they need in terms of funding, we provide that. Only last week, we released some funding for a summer plan, um, that visibility. You know, what people are telling us is they want to see more uniform presence, they want to see more fire services in, in, the, in the area, the local authority, ASB offices, that joint working partnership bit. So that was released last week, and you'll see a little bit more in terms of that visibility bit. Um, as the boss mentioned, the, the early intervention is really key for us. Um, I think last year when I when I came looking to the issues in Fleming and, and, and Grove Hill, um, we talk about group of young people, and now I'm really confident that we tier approach those. What that means is we tier one, two, and three. Um, so we've got a cohort of tier ones, twos, and threes, where Nigel uh, really track our progress, making sure that in terms of what tier one is, they, they are the lowest offending, first time coming to notice. How can police and local authority work with the family? To get into those and early intervention those kids um we've got the statistics i think we've got three tier three which are the the ones that are reoffending and going into criminality and coming to my area of enforcement um so we've got the tight grip on those in those figures um just reassuring you that 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 happens every two months and the local team meets probably weekly daily having conversation about providing i know matt will probably give an update on huge amount of summer activities um from local authority um, in terms of free, you know, free martial art classes for girls, et cetera, et cetera, which I'm sure the local authority will update. Thank you, Derek. Now, George, you want to come in, please? Thank you, Chair. Just very briefly, I, I can assure members that we have an excellent working relationship with, with Humberside Police. Uh, across the borders, the council will cover a little bit more about early intervention when we talk about the, the next agenda item. But, you know, just to reassure you, there are lots of mechanisms in place. We work very closely with, with Derek and, and other members of his team. So it's it's effective, it's embedded, and I'll provide you with some evidence of that coming up. Thank you, Nigel. We have got two questionnaires coming in. Uh, Councillor Peter Astor, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I've got a couple of questions, but primarily to David. You mentioned uh, in your um, preamble about lack of facilities. Could you... Um, explain what type of facilities you envisage would be um, to encourage the young people. Thank you. Um, I think sometimes it's not actually a lack of facilities, it's lack of access to facilities. So if I can give you an example, um, I was speaking to my team in Driffield a couple of days ago, um, and one of the beat managers, one of my police officers, was coming on on a late shift um, to go to supervise and support a football session at the local um, sports centre. So I, I questioned 
the right thing to do, but I questioned because my offices aren't social workers, they are youth workers, they are outreach workers. Um, so then I spoke to him and asked about the facilities and a private charity is funding the cost at the local sports centre of the use of the outdoor pitch for the local kids to use. I beg the question, it's about access to facilities as well. And, you know, as a partnership, you know, are we comfortable that for, to deliver services in our area, that charities are providing that support in order to hire the local leisure centre for the kids to play? I don't know the answer. If, if that's the business economic model, then, then that must be it. So it's not often about the facilities, it's about access to them. And if that charity wasn't paying for that, then who would be? And if there weren't, then the access to facilities isn't there for the kids. Yeah, exactly, uh, David. Uh, um, you, you bang on there in what you're saying. I represent the ward, which uh, you mentioned, Derek, um, Fleming Gate, Groville area. Um, and um, to be honest with you, um, there is problems, but I don't think the problems are any worse than anywhere else. Um, there, you do get worse times uh, as such. Um, my problem I've got is I don't see many police officers out and about uh, on a night. I see plenty of cars up at the fire station, County 12 the other day. I'm sure they all were in. Um, but I, I just think that we, we don't see um, the amount of police around the town in general. And yet I read a report last week that you've increased, you, you've got 12 new Bobbies, supported vehicles at Driffield. Um, and I just think, you know, there is a problem um, there. And I'm talking about the wider picture here. Um, I, I think also we've not mentioned Bridlington and, I, and, and that is the largest populated area in, in, in the East Riding. And I would like to know um, what your stats are for there, because I do know that there is an area of Bridlington antisocial behaviour has been high, and I think it, although it hasn't hit the headlines, I think it remains relatively high. Thank you. Thank you. Um, to the point at Driffield, um, we are investing, um, you, you've a word of uplift, the, the national um, programme for, for recruitment of officers. Um, we are putting uh, additional officers up at Driffield. That'll be a 24-7 response base. So you might think, what's the benefit to me then sat, sat in Beverly? Well, the reality is that those officers will be covering the area of Driffield. Uh, and going to point about Bridlington as well, the officers that currently cover Driffield migrate between there and Bridlington. So the extra capacity that we're building into Driffield will actually support policing in Beverly and uh, and in Bridlington, because the staff from here will not be drawn up towards Driffield, to the outer villages, et cetera, that they currently cover. So we should see more resources actually as a result of that investment in Driffield, um, supporting more policing in Beverly and Bridlington. One so, more, Peter. Yeah, so um, coming back to your, to your original about facilities, um, David, um, how do we get funding, more funding, um, for the East Riding area? Is there more funding via the PCC or central government, via yourself? Uh, how do we get more funding for the East Riding area? Thank you. Um, I'm not an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> um, th th there, there are lots of different pots available money you mentioned pcc um and there are nationally the government do put schemes on occasionally where they can bring money in um but what i would say is that that money tends to be time limited this is about investment for the future um and it's about prioritization and you know facilities like the ones that i mentioned earlier being funded um actually that is is, is that an investment investor save now in terms of quality of life and life chances um all I would say is, you know, I have to make decisions about prioritisation of my resources every day. Um, and some of them are quite tough. Um, you know, as a collective, um, I think the council um, and other agencies and partners needs, needs to do the same. And, and maybe um, those facilities just need to be a little bit higher on that priority. 
I'd like to interject there, Peter. Matthew uh, Templeton would like to answer that question. Good morning. Um, I will touch on the point of business and finance a bit more in our presentation shortly, but um, ACC David Marshall is, is right in regards that he needs sustainable uh, investments and, and a more strategic thought applied to the issues that, that you've raised and these keep on popping up time and time again. Um, but it has been announced this week as part of Antisocial Behaviour Awareness Week that the government have released um, what they are terming the Million Hours Fund, which is funding for youth activities um, until 2025. So this uh, grant pots from 300 to 10,000 um, pounds, and they are going to be awarded to voluntary sector community organisations, statutory bodies and schools to deliver um, interventions and programmes for young people um, over periods, over seasonal periods like summer, uh, winter. Um, now, our two identified areas for the East Riding, because there has to be identified areas, um, are the Minster and Woodmansey and Tranby. Um, the reason they've been identified is due to the amount of service requests relating to young people in ASB in those areas. So we do start to see pots of money and funding like this be popping up time and time again. But this is part of how we shape our partnership finance approach towards where our needs are. And you've rightly mentioned Burlington South, which I'll come on to shortly, which is our greatest area of need. Thank you for that update, Matthew. I've got three more questionnaires coming in. I'd like to start with you, please, Gareth. No, Gareth, please. Um, thank you. Um, much of what's uh, just been said has covered um, what I was actually going to what I was actually going to say. Um, but first of all, I'd like to thank Nigel. Nigel came out to Poppington to discuss antisocial behaviour and to talk to the three new ward councillors there. Um, and that connection uh, is so, so important. And uh, it's really good to hear that the partnerships are working so well. Uh, I suppose my, my question really relates to that funding element and, and a comment you made earlier about capability and capacity of, of other agencies in supporting you and your work. Um, the funding's obviously ring fenced and time bound, um, and we're making reference to the longevity of facilities so that young people have access to a football pitch, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my question is, how can we support uh, as a council, mm -hmm. uh, as councillors, uh, in enabling that uh, and bringing the agencies together more from your point of view? I wouldn't dare tell you how to work but my suggestion maybe if you'll forget allow me um it, it, it is about actually understanding what prioritization is and, and i do understand that you know adult social care all these things are really really challenging and you know the, the the funding pot is small and often reducing um but my plea would be that actually this is about long-term investment uh and you know it, it does have benefits um, I can talk about trauma informed. We can talk about uh, adverse childhood experiences and all this kind of thing. But actually, giving kids from deprived backgrounds and and people do not from the outside do not see deprivation in East Riding because it's a beautiful county, isn't it? You know, so they don't often see the poverty in those rural areas in those villages. But there are some kids out there, young people that have got real challenges in terms of you know their outlook of their life chances, uh, and uh, actually things like going and playing football with a group, seeing there's a wider world out there can actually open their horizons and really change life chances. So it, it genuinely is an investment. And I know it's difficult, but my plea would be, please just have in the back of your mind when you're setting those budgets about the long-term sustainability and importance of those facilities. Thank you. I'd like to bring Angela in now, and then I've got two more questionnaires. Um, we're running short of time, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to say that when we go on to the next agenda item, the Community Safety Partnership, I think we will draw out some of those issues around multi-agency working and funding that we've got and maybe some of the opportunities for the future that Matthew's already started to mention. So I think we will cover that. Thank you. That's excellent, Angela. Thank you. Right, and Paul, over to you, sir. Beyond. Um, it's higher. It's it's just really to clarify something you said, which I felt was quite important, and some of it you've already answered. I, I do concede. You said Beverly was one of your hotspots. Um, in your opinion, do you think if we had a dedicated facility to help young people, would that have a direct impact and reduce antisocial behaviour in the area? 
at this point, I'm going to bow out and ask my expert from Beverly. So when we talk about hotspots, I mean, every, like Poplinton you talk about, and Brillington we spoke about earlier, every area of pop, uh, have hotspots. And as the boss mentioned, we are so data rich and the team are absolutely got clarity of where the hotspots are. I think when you talk about facilities, you know, I know Matt will talk about some of the funding we've got from the PCC already around uh, the Cherry Tree project. Um, it's been innovative for the kids because actually a lot of time we go back to the old school of they need youth clubs and actually they don't want to go to these places. They want online gaming. They want facility like IT, et cetera. It's how do we get into those? Um, would it increase? Is that what the question as well? Or would it would it sort of make an impact on the hotspots? Um, I don't think the, the kids are going away anywhere. Um, we're going to actually gather them into these uh, these venues. Is that management of that? Um, you know, we talk about Twilight Football earlier. You know, every Friday, I know um, at the Leisure Centre here, over 100 children go to the football session with our officers, and that creates a bit of demand as well. Uh, you know, ASB, perception, we talked about 100 kids going to one-stop shop, getting drinks afterwards. What does that look like? Um, so I think, you know, when you increase a facility, it, it gathers people, it gathers young people together. But it's how do we role model that? How do we move that behaviour in terms of what we think about any social behaviour is to a role model in a community, actually going to one-stop shop, being a customer and not causing problems. Um, our, our staff's really investing in that. So hopefully that helps you, th that question. I don't think it'll go away to hotspots. I think it'll actually increase that people looking at children, 100 kids playing football at uh, at the ledge centre is a challenge, isn't it? But we're committed to to do that and deliver that, deliver that for the community. Thank you very much, Derek. Uh, Rick, sir. Right, thanks very much. Um, I was on the Teams meeting with Derek and we spoke to Inspector Bede of in Bridlington. Um, I understood you had funding for a certain amount of PCOs and you had three vacancies and one had been filled. Do you find it, do you find you have trouble filling these vacancies? And if so, why, what do you think? Why do you read, what's the reason you don't get them filled? Is there any specific reason that they aren't suitable people or nobody really wants the job? Um, I don't I don't think we have issues filling in this area. Um, we do in some other areas because of the geographics. Um, and we've we have just commenced a um intake of PCSOs. Forgive me, I, I don't know if they've just started or about to start, but um we, we've actually continued to have vacancies that we tried to fill in, in North Links on the South Bank. Um, but all the applicants were from from around here and clearly you, you can't travel that far every day. So it hasn't particularly been an issue here. We have recently done a, a little bit of a restructure of our neighbourhood teams, and we've put additional some additional police officers in. Um, and the result of that, there was there was some challenges in that because the course for PCSOs it is a full course, it's properly accredited and all that kind of stuff. We need a certain number of people to run the courses. So sometimes we have we do run with a vacancy here and there, so simply because we can't just bring one pe person in and put them on a five week, eight week course on their own. So, um, but I, I can assure you, all the vacancies that we've currently got, I think in I think there's, a, I think there's eight or twelve in. East Riding. Um, my understanding is that all those have been filled or will be filled in the very near future as people come in because we have got the right applicants. Thanks. Okay, Rick. Have you got anything finalised to say before we end up your session, uh, please, Derek and David? So we have quite a bit on the agenda that we haven't covered, so apologies, but we, we can certainly circulate some of the information around, uh, if you like. Um, I just want to, if I may, just talk about knife crime because I, I know it's quite contentious and, and people are concerned about national rise in in. Uh, knife crime um in 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 east riding compared to the baseline we've had a seven sorry a f just a six percent reduction which is seven offenses so you, you can put the context around that um we do continue to challenge we do consider to we continue to actively approach uh, people um we actively do deal with people for weapons uh, and we are proactive um we undertake stop search which again sometimes is a contentious tool but we undertake stop search um, and make sure that where the grounds are, we, we are searching people and recovering what, knives and taking weapons off the street. Our outcome rate, so when we do search somebody, um, in a, the latest figures I've got is we arrest or do find a positive outcome, so we will find something uh, on 20, just over 26% of the time, so just over one in four times. So we are targeting stop search, hopefully at the right people. 
as a disruption tool, but to also take knives and other weapons off the street. Um, and the next thing people are interested in about stop search is disproportionality. In other words, if I'm a, a young black lad living in the area, am I massively more likely to be stopped and searched? Um, our latest ethnicity data will say that it, it's around on parity. So approximately 2% of uh, people who are searched are from uh, an ethnically diverse background, i.e. non-white. Um, and that's roughly in line with what the census data is telling us about the population makeup of the area. So we don't feel... We don't feel there's a disproportionate issue, but clearly we need to make sure that every stop search that's done is uh, ethical uh, and it's justified and it's proportionate. Thank you. Are you on to finish, Derek? I've got nothing else to add. I know time is precious, so uh, if there's any questions for us, this is great. Okay, then. Um, actually, wonderful having you here and seeing the new uh, David. Uh, thank, thank you for your contribution for today's meeting. I'm hopefully that a lot of things you've said, we as ward councillors can take away and actively pursue the better of it going forward. Uh, no doubt you'll be getting emails coming through from our colleagues here, uh, following up on giving you some. I certainly have got a couple I'll be sending out to you in retrospect, which I think is what the job's all about, really, at the end of the day. So unless anybody's got anything in particular they want to, Add, I'd like to thank you both very much and uh, I wish you a good day. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I think we'll have a little five minute recess. I think one or two people want to pop out and then we'll carry on if that's all right. I think somebody wants to. Uh, Noble one of the gentlemen here leaving.
go off the About one more minute, just waiting for uh, Samantha. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we'll continue now, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. Uh, can I now ask for the next uh, next uh, slaughterhouse lady to step up? Angela, over to you, dear. It's me, me first, oh. Chair. We are we ready? Thank you, Chair. Morning, members. The report before you today that I have the pleasure to introduce is regarding the East Riding Community Safety Partnership, and we've actually touched on quite a few things in the previous item that I think will be covered under this in more detail. The report sets out the partnership's current priorities and future plans, and I think crucially for me, demonstrates the importance of partnership working, tackling community issues across the East Riding and the wider Humber region, and particularly sharing data to help us hone in our own services as partners to tackle those. And of course, working and utilising the voluntary sector to, to do that too through Neighbourhood Watch and other voluntary organisations who are a key part in this. I think the report shows there's been really good work recently, particularly in tackling rural crime, again, as we touched on in the previous item, and antisocial behaviour. And I'm sure you want to ask a few more questions on that in, in this session. I'll now hand over to our Director of Housing and Transportation and Public Protection, who will take us through in a bit more detail. Thank you, Councillor Hammond, and good morning, everyone. Morning to the committee. Um, as Councillor Hammond has said, there's um, much that we can continue to talk about as we present um, this overview of the East Riding Community Safety Partnership. And I have colleagues here that I'll introduce shortly who will give more detail um, in terms of the report. But I just wanted to highlight to committee members that the report today is very much an overview um, of the activity of the Community Safety Partnership, and there will be other items that we'll bring in to, to this subcommittee later on in the year, particularly because it was highlighted by, by our police colleagues. There's a specific report on violence against women and girls um, scheduled for the September meeting. Also on that same agenda is violence prevention partnerships, so there'll be more detail there. And then we'll be bringing the domestic abuse strategy in October. So I just wanted to highlight to members that this is very much the start really of a number of reports that we'll start to provide more detail to yourselves and opportunities um, for scrutiny. So I'm going to hand over to colleagues now who are going to give a brief presentation around some of the, the key areas um, in the report today. And I think we're starting with Matthew Temperton, Community Safety Manager. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. And thank you, committee, for having me here today. Um, so my role is there's the business manager um, for the East Riding Community Safety Partnership. So that includes... Um, overseeing the finance and, and business um, of the partnership, but also includes uh, the steering of projects and of the partnership working. Um, I've also had my colleagues here, Nigel Brignall today, who's the manager of the antisocial behaviour team, and uh, David Barlow from the Safeguard and Adults Board, who's the development and implementation lead, who will talk about modern day slavery. Um, we have got a presentation. Um, Chair, are you happy for me to share that onto the screen? Yes, please. Okay, it's bear with me. Thank you. So the presentation will be under 10 minutes um, and it should give an overview um, and speaks to our uh, report. Um, so each officer will have a few minutes each and then uh, if you're happy chair, we'll open for questions. Thank you very much. So the East Riding Community Safety Partnership is a multi-agency strategic group and it's set up um, as required by the Crime and Disorder Act 1998. So the Community Safety Partnership seeks to ensure that community safety in East Ryden is community driven and community led. And it's a place where different communities have their needs met and people feel safe and secure. The partnership approach is built on the premise that no single agency can deal with or be responsible for dealing with complex community safety issues. And these issues can be addressed more effectively and efficiently through working in partnership. So statutory partners to our board include Humberside Police who are present today. East Riding of Yorkshire Council, Humberside Fire and Rescue Service, 
the probation service and the NHS Humber and North Yorkshire ICB or Integrated Care Board. We also have uh, guests on our partnership as well, uh, including the voluntary sector uh, and where needed the prison services. Now I did come to this committee about 12 months ago and one of the um, discussions we had was around um, what is the current community safety partnership strategy. We we're very much working uh, towards that at the time and I'm pleased to present that we now have the final product the strategy and we're happy to share that following uh, today's committee um, but what I wanted to talk about today was um, our six priorities um, as part of the strategy um, as you can hopefully see on the screen these are supporting victims and protecting vulnerable people from harm reducing reoffending, tackling preventing cybercrime fraud and scamming promote being safe and feeling safe in your community, countering terrorism, radicalization and extremism, and alcohol and substance use reduction. Now these are quite broad strategic priorities and I think it really goes some way to showcasing the amounts of service and agency work that goes on within the community safety partnership. For example, we take priority six. This, is, this highlights the work of the 10 year combating drug strategy from the government, which is overseen by public health. Um, we can look at priority one, supporting victims and protect, protecting vulnerable people from harm. We've already raised um, the rising rates of domestic abuse here today. Um, this would include the work of our local authority domestic abuse services, um, right through to the protect and prevent remits of counterterrorism that sits under the Community Safety Partnership. So it's a really big piece of work. Um, and following this, when the uh, strategy paper is um, made uh, available to you all, um, you'll be able to read a bit further into some of these priority areas. So what are some of the key developments over the last 12 months? Um, we'd developed and submitted our business plan for the Community Safety Partnership um, last year, and that was agreed by our Police and Crime Commissioner, uh, and it offers us 735,000 of core funding to the Community Safety Partnership. Um, our Police Crime Commissioner in Humberside is an outlier in the fact that he invests heavily in his community safety partnerships among the four unitary authorities. Um, that isn't common practice nationally, but it does allow us um, some investment and ability to have quite a proactive community safety partnership within the East Riding and across the Humber. Um, this then has allowed us to really develop our partnership working both locally and regionally. Um, we have our colleagues from police here today. Um, we've talked about some of the embedded uh, work we're doing, and this really extends into communities. So we've mentioned local youth groups and the work that the CSP is doing with local youth groups, um, local community groups from our domestic abuse engagement workers. Um, we're doing a lot of partnership work with our rural and heritage task force. Uh, we've recently been um, awarded 113,000 for the rural crime project through the community safety partnership. Um, and we're doing a lot more work collectively with other Humber authorities through the Community Safety Partnerships, which is allowing us to pull in bigger national funding pots um, and identify where our need is across the area. We're doing lots of partnership work regionally as well, for example, with our organised crime um, regional policing groups around certain hotspot areas to look at projects. And we're also doing a lot more work with our regional health bodies as well to understand uh, population data and crime data and drivers for crime. I touched a bit around products that drive innovation. We talked about the Rural Crime Project that's launching on the 19th of this month at Griffield Show. Um, that offers significant additional capacity to a uh, rural and heritage crime task force, including off-road vehicles and AMPR cameras for main arterial routes. We talked about Operation Yellowfin, which has been funded through the Community Safety Partnership. And last year, we were also successful in pulling in um, £95,000 of Home Office funding for um, the Mints and Woodmancy Ward to support young people and seek to reduce ASB in the area. We currently have projects um, being submitted around the nighttime economy for products around violence against women and girls to consider self-defence classes in communities. Um, we're also looking at domestic abuse products under a funding project and also at free graffiti hotspots as well. I mentioned on this slide as well, um, our emphasis of using data 
to uh, target a uh, resource. Um, we've recently financed and recruited an analyst that sits from the East Riding of Yorkshire Council of Business Intelligence team. I'm um, aware the police have talked about data today and data has been questioned. What we want to start to progress towards is a smarter use of data. Uh, most occurred crimes in East Riding, um, land in Bridlington South, 11.7%. What we want to do is layer and understand better partner data from health, from police, from local authority population data to better understand the drivers of crime and serious violence in our area so we can target resource in a more sophisticated way moving forward. We also need to understand and respond to current pressures within the partnership. For example, our rate of domestic homicide reviews has really gone up over the past few years. Um, we need to have an appropriate response to those. We need to do justice to the victims and their families. So we need to consider ways we resource and finance those reviews and how we implement and carry those out. And as we mentioned on police today as well, there's also seen a significant rise in domestic abuse and in serious violence. So I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, um, Nigel Brignall, who's the manager of the antisocial behaviour team. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, just talk to you a couple of minutes, very brief overview of antisocial behaviour in the East Riding. Some of the things which we, we do, um, I'll give you a few stats. We've had lots of stats, I'll, I'll throw a few more into the pot. And also some plans which we have going forward, which you will have seen in the report. The response to antisocial behaviour in the East Riding is very much victim-led. Some of you will recall the, the Pilkington case, the sad case a few years ago, uh, and the government legislated following that making a lot of tools and powers which are out there very much victim focused. Within the East Riding, not just in, in our team, but within the police, within different council services, victims of antisocial behavior are all risk assessed. Those most vulnerable in our, in our community are identified and dedicated support plans are put in place, multi-agency support plans, and there are lots of information sharing uh, facilities there. But also, as well as victims, we have perpetrators. I think it's safe to say that it's a very, very small minority of people in the East Riding who are perpetrators of antisocial behaviour. We've heard about youths, young people, diversionary activities. It's very important to provide those. It's equally important, I would suggest, that targeted intervention is done with ringleaders, whether they are young people or whether they are adults. And there are a number of services within the council uh, who, who will provide different intervention packages. We firmly believe in early intervention. Identify people early, and we have, as I've mentioned before, excellent working relationships with the police to identify those causing a nuisance in our community. And, we're, and, and they feed into what we call the fairway process. And I've got a slide in a, a couple of slides time where I'll very briefly summarise some of the event interventions we've used over the last five years. A few stats. Um, these are the number of service requests which uh, we've received in the ASB team over the last five years. The, uh, the, the column at the left were, was an average number pretty much prior to COVID. We were averaging around about 600 service requests a year. It peaked during COVID, which is very, very interesting. I can't tell you why but it did. And then, you know, looking at the data which you have there and also current data in the, the current year, we are now averaging uh, in, in the region of high 700s, 800 calls, calls for service a year. I talked about the fairway process. We got the next slide. Yeah. There it is, sorry. Uh, right, so the fairway process has been in place since 2005 in the East Riding. It's a, it's a joint process which we use with colleagues from Humberside Police, and it's very much focused around early intervention. There are a number of tools and powers which we can use. However, early intervention, fairways, it's a warning letter. Once somebody's identified as causing antisocial behaviour, if they are aged between 10 and 18, we will write to their parent or guardian to say that their child has behaved antisocially. It also applies to adults. I've not broken this graph down by child and adults, but you will see 
the amount of people who receive that first intervention is high. It's lowered in recent years, come on to that. But the key thing is the number of people who require a further intervention, the orange bar, significantly less in every single year, which you can see there. And it's been significantly less in every year since 2005. It costs round about five pounds to send a fairway letter out to warn somebody. If it's parent or guardian, it gives them the chance to do something without ages having to spend significant amounts of resource dealing with further issues. And it keeps them out of the criminal justice system as well. You will see that works, in my opinion. Other bars which you can see there, then we start getting into more legal tools. The key thing which I wanted to highlight here is early intervention works. We are not frightened to use legal tools and powers. We do use legal tools and powers where necessary, but they are targeted. Some of the things which we, which we do, you've heard mention of rural crime from, from David earlier. Again, we have an excellent working relationship with the police rural crime team. We, uh, we apply the fairway process to that for people who come from out of the East Riding, many people from North Yorkshire, further afield uh, to, to her course. We use fairway letter. We will also use community protection notices, which is a, a, another legal tool which we have. We were the first authority in the country to use community protection notices in response to hair coursing. That's now been rolled out to many areas uh, across the country and throughout the north of England. I know the rural crime team and I've been involved too. are looking at a nine force community protection notice. That's a legal way to keep people potentially, well, when they come to the East Riding, it puts um, some quite stringent requirements on them. We've issued around about 50 of those in relation to hair coursing. Only a handful have been breached. The most recent one, it was the highest level fine we had, just for basically somebody came into the East Riding. One of the requirements is when they come, the dog has to have a tag uh, on it and it has to have uh, uh, some identification mark that it's got to be microchipped to the owner. We prosecuted a breach and the fine was well in excess of £1,000, which we publicised. Again, they work, partnership working. Neighbourhood Watch. Again, you will see reference in the report to Neighbourhood Watch. We have almost 400 active Neighbourhood Watch groups in the East Riding. Um, we took that over when the, the former Homicide Association of Neighbourhood Watch groups um, ceased to exist. Again, it's developed. We've recently had a, an annual Neighbourhood Watch networking event, which uh, some of you were present when we had a, a number of coordinators attended. It continues to grow. We are very keen now. We, we've got a good coverage across the East Riding. Going forward, we are looking at trying to make them more effective in crime prevention within their local communities. And that's our, our key focus for the coming year, and it will be for the year after. Graffiti, again, as a service, uh, some of you will, will have reported to you, reports of graffiti. Again, we, we, we have a process in which, again, we will use community protection notices if necessary. Uh, we also engage with the contractor to get graffiti removed very, very quickly. We average about 140 reports a year, which come to us. We can take enforcement action. The key thing is to get the graffiti off quickly, following the broken windows theory. If we don't, it'll attract more and increase people's fear of crime. Last one I'll just very briefly mention, public spaces protection orders, PSPOs, to, 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 uh, to use the acronym. There are 168 public spaces protection orders in the East Riding. Every single ward, every single parish has got its own order. They traditionally cover controlling the presence of dogs. They control the consumption of alcohol in certain areas. And they will also co control um, public access, alligating. We don't use alligating too often, but certainly everyone's got some, some, um, some control of the presence of dogs. We also use them for public safety. Uh, and again, uh, some, some orders in some parishes specifically designed to, to deal with public safety. I'll leave it at that, but I'll quite happily take obviously questions at the end. Thank you. Morning, everybody. 
Um, I'm Dave Ballas. I work for the East Riding Safeguarding Adults Board, and I, I just want to spend a little bit of um, time this, this morning to talk about modern slavery and the modern slavery arrangements um, across the East Riding. So in terms of modern slavery, um, the East Riding Safeguarding Adults Board, along with, the, along with the local authority, the police, and many, many other partners are or work in partnership with the Humber Modern Slavery Partnership. So again, what that is, it's, it's a strategic network of agencies across um, the Humber side footprint um, who work together, who are committed to tackling uh, modern slavery. So um, it's, it's basically about improving awareness and sort of like working together to make the East Riding a difficult place for modern slavery to, to exist. Um, and also importantly, um, somewhere uh, where people are supported in and out of the national referral mechanism, which is sort of like the, the national uh, mechanism around um, modern slavery. Um, so in terms of the role of, of, of um, the safeguarding board, across the East Riding, the safeguarding board was um, it was was um, uh, given the task of, of being the lead partner in terms of of um, modern slavery and taking sort of like the modern slavery uh, agenda forward. So I don't know if you uh, just want to move into the um, to the to the next slide. So. So basically, you've got the Humber Modern Slavery Partnership, which is the um, the Humber, covers the Humber side footprint, sort of like, and the the four different um, local authority areas in inside that. Um, they meet on a quarterly basis. Underneath that, you've got the East Riding Local Modern Slavery Partnership, and again, we work on uh, or we meet on a a quarterly basis as as well. Um, in terms of sort of like how big the issue is. Um, across the East Riding. So Homicide Police do provide us with um, uh, uh, figures around um, NRM uh, referrals, modern slavery investigations and intelligence submissions. So just to go through some very, very high level figures. Now, I do apologise, these are from April, but this is the most up-to-date information that we've got at the moment, because I believe the Umzad police are looking at their dashboard at the moment and reviewing the way that it's being reported. So just in terms of active investigations, these investigations by the force, in, um, which are live at the moment, there's, there were two in April, um, which has remained the same as, as the number of live investigations uh, in March. Uh, over the last 12 months, there's been 48 modern slavery investigations, um, which was a slight increase on, on the sort of like previous 12 months where it was 38. So in terms of the Humberside police footprint, the East Riding and sort of like modern slavery investigations over its footprint, the East Riding accounted for 15% of investigations over um, the last 12 months. And to give you an idea of sort of like how it is roughly, we're roughly looking at three a month. Overall, there's an increasing trend um, in the East Riding over the uh, period from uh, January 2018. Okay, so in terms of national referral mechanisms, so um, so basically, if somebody is, is a victim of, of modern slavery and accepts that they are a victim of modern slavery and gives their consent, they can be referred into the national referral mechanism, which is a support mechanism for um, uh, uh, to to help them in terms of their situation, in terms of um, um, modern slavery. So in terms of sort of like NRM submissions for the East Riding, um, there was one in April, which has gone down from a, as a, on a decrease of, of three in March. Um, in the last 12 months, um, in terms of total NRM submissions across the, um, the force footprint, 15% um, uh, of them were in the East Riding. Um, if you look at the year to date, submit, and this is last year, um, submissions has decre have decreased year on year in by 15%. So in terms of um, modern slavery, so modern slavery covers a, a plethora of sort of like um, different types of modern slavery, which I, which I, I could go into in sort of like in great, greater detail if, if needed. Um, in terms of the East Riding though, so criminal exploitation for juveniles was the most prevalent type of um, 
uh, uh, exploitation of, of modern slavery. So what we're talking about there, so that can be things like um, people are coerced into county lines, for example, they are coerced into shoplifting, they are, they are coerced into um, pickpocketing, those sort of crimes in terms of criminal exploitation. Um, in terms of sort of like the most prominent um, exploitation amongst adults was forced labour. So this could be anything from forced labour in sort of like farms, for example. It could be linked to sort of things like uh, debt bondage or car washes um, and um, f uh, farming, fisheries, the those sort of things. Um, I'll take questions at the end, <laughs> if that's OK, if anyone's got any questions on this. So in terms of intelligence, then, so um, if if one of your um, constituents wanted to report um, um, a suspected case of modern slavery, so what we would all always say, that if someone is in, in, in danger, um, then it would be ring 999 um, or 101 to, to make that that um that submission if it's if it's more just to pass on intelligence of where you may think that there is a suspicion there around modern slavery there's two things that they can do they can they can either call the um local authorities um safeguarding adults team so if you just go through the switchboard on 393939 um and ask for the safeguarding adults team they will then take the information and look at that and look at doing um uh, an intelligence submission, but um, people can also sort of like um, make a submission themselves. So if they go on the Homicide Police website, there is a sort of like a partnership information form, what we call a PIF form, which is where they can sort of like make a submission around um, uh, around suspected modern slavery. So in terms of where that leads us in terms of how many we're, we're seeing at the moment, um, you can see that there was one in April, which is an increase um, which is half by 50%, I suppose, which was two in May. Um, year to date, there were 15 submissions um, made, which year on year is, has decreased by 17%. Um, you can see there that the, the submissions that are being um, um, submitted are primarily related to forced labour, um, um, which uh, since 2017, but in 2021, there's been a downturn with only three submitted. Okay. Um, so if anybody's got any questions, I'm happy to answer to answer those. If you want to go into sort of like the, the arrangements um, or if you want to talk about some of the different types of modern slavery, I'm quite happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for that team. It's very, very well put together. First question I've got is from Councillor Barbara Jeffries. Yes, uh, David, on on the slavery, modern slavery, as you were speaking, I was thinking there's a an invisible population we have in our community, isn't there, um, that we don't normally see, but is normally found, if you look hard enough, uh, in hospitality, isn't it, restaurants and, um, uh, and so on. Um, and so I'm wondering how, what, what are the pinpoints? What what are the signs? Do you think that would that would raise our antennae that something's not quite right here, something's wrong in um, in a situation where there there is modern slavery in in say a restaurant? Um, what is it that that we would be on the lookout? Okay, so I'm. Um... It was it was um, National Safeguarding Week a couple of weeks ago, and as part of that, um, in the East Riding, we launched something called Modern Slavery Champions. So, what we what we're looking to achieve through the Modern Slavery Champion program is to raise awareness. So we talked about we talked area earlier about sort of like. Um, Tra trauma trauma informed practice so if, if you were if you like we're sort of like um applying that's a similar model to um to modern slavery where people are uh, are moving from a position of being modern slavery aware to modern slavery informed 
So what we've done is we've invited sort of like partners um, from organisations across the East Riding to become a modern slavery champion. So what that means is we go, we deliver uh, training to them around modern slavery, the different types and what some of the signs are. So it, it could be just just for example, if someone was was subject to, to forced um, labour, you might, if, if a member of the public might, might uh, met them, there might be very withdrawn, there might be always be with somebody else. And if you're having a conversation with them, um, it would be the other person who would answer the questions for them. They might be um, dishevelled. They might, you know, you, you're talking a, about looking, looking at, uh, at the floor. It would depend very much on the type of, of modern slavery. But like I said, what, what we're trying to do is improve that awareness for um, for for uh, modern slavery champions so that they can promote that in their organizations and our presentation that we there's a separate presentation which we deliver around modern slavery champions which does go into more detail in terms of some of the signs that that you, that you might see um so i mean it, it again it very much would depend on the type of modern slavery but if you were looking at at some sort of forced labour, then it might be that the, you would meet someone who was in a situation where, um, like I said, they're very withdrawn, they don't engage with people, um, they might have somebody else there who is controlling them, so who would answer questions for them. Um, they could look dis dishevelled because, for example, if if we use an example of somebody who has who has come to this country because they've been promised say employment, they, they might then find themselves um, in in what we could, we call sort of like debt bondage, which was where is somebody has arranged sort of like a, a job for them, someone has arranged somewhere for, for them to live. Um, but then what what happens is the reality of the situation is um, they they you know they will, they will come here um they will probably have some of their uh, identification and bank details taken from them um they end up working but the pay would go directly to that third party who's controlling them um and it might be that effectively they they're not seeing um any benefits of that employment because it's going the money is going directly to that third party um one of the things that we're working on with um, the South Bank is we're working on sort of like um, a program where we're, we're trying to raise that awareness through a, a number of sort of like posters, which are called Who Is? So, for example, this is to try and get people to, to think about. So it's like, who is washing your car, for example? Who is, um, who is doing your nails? Um, and even things like who is using your food bank, because if you've got a scenario where somebody's in in that sort of like debt bondage and they're they're basically in a property, they're not getting not receiving money. Um, we have found cases where people are having then having who are in subject to modern slavery who are having to use um, uh, food banks because they again they can't afford to feed themselves as part of that. Um, I mean, I, I can talk and talk and talk and talk uh, on this point, and I'm more than uh, happy to sort of like, um, we, we do have a sort of like spot the signs poster, so I'm more than happy to to distribute that with the minutes of this. Yes, please, Paul. Hi, I have a question for Matthew, if that's okay. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned that you received £90,000 worth of funding to put into your project. May I just clarify where that funding came from, please? Yeah, of course. So we uh, applied to a central government pot of money uh, called Safe First Streets Fund 4. Um, so it's from, provided from the Home Office. Uh, Safer Streets is, is just on the verge of releasing their fifth um, round of funding. So each round will target slightly different uh, themes, some might be ASB, some might be violence against women and girls, residents feeling safe in the community. Um, so we were awarded uh, approximately 92,000 and we had to offer some match funding in as well. Um, we had had to identify an LSOA or ward area with a higher rate um, as part of that application. Um, some areas might kind of look to purchase CCTV cameras for an area of a higher crime rate. Um, we have looked at a bit of an experimental bid where we're using a partnership work in an area um, to see how we can 
um, support youth provision and uh, organisations within an area, but also try and um, improve or consult with the public and then improve uh, our feelings of safety. Um, so that's where the money came from originally. Oh yeah, and uh, just to follow up on that, have you spent all that budget and also who decides how that budget will be spent? No, so the money is split over two periods. One has passed, which was 22-23. Uh, the second period uh, is currently live. So the Home Office funded period finishes at the end of September, but there's a continuation of match funding from partners in the Community Safety Partnership. We have um, like a project group and a governance body, which is Beverly Joint Youth Partnership for that. Um, so we would come collectively together to look at how we'd um, put that spend into place. It's also overseen by the Police Crime Commissioner's Office as well, who's the governing body. OK, thank you. Gareth, please. Um, first of all, thank you for your presentations. Really appreciate them. Um, really, it, it's following on from that, because obviously we've heard about the importance of, of really intervention and and long-term investment to allow young people um, uh, to avoid crime uh, in the future. And it's it's really understanding where that, that 95,000 is going, because obviously we've got 113,000 going into rural crime, um, and 95,000 is relatively short-term. I know it's linked to bids and things like that. Is there any way that we can sort of look at how we are as a, as a council for supporting the, the need for long-term investment? I know it's difficult with Home Office funding, um, because of the nature of the bidding process, but but really it's sort of joining up our conversations really, and that that's uh, from a critical friend point of view and simplistic person like myself, it's understanding how that works. Yeah, thank you. We were actually when we put that bid together last year in three days from start to finish, so it was quite quickly, and we were very pleased to receive that funding. It was then the ability to look at the the partnership setup we had in the area of Beverly and how we could best um, manoeuvre on that project. And we're quite proud of the, the summer delivery programme we've got coming up. Um, and then we can uh, announce shortly, um, which offers, I think, interventions every single day uh, for young people. And myself and Derek have also identified some money for what we're calling a walkabout talkabout scheme, where there's more offices in the area um, that can be can be visible around that those peak seasonal times. Um, what we're trying to do with this project in Beverly is still fairly short term and the funding, as you mentioned, is short term as well, which with central government funding is always a bit of a, an issue and can sometimes prohibit local authorities and areas from bidding into. Um, but we would like to create a bit of a profile and evidence basis to say, actually, this has worked, this hasn't worked, this is what we need to learn from and put it into the wider system. You mentioned around uh, the short termism and then the longer term investment. Um, as our colleagues in police mentioned earlier, it's around uh, what elected members can do to support this discussion at those those levels. Um, you know, it, what what we're going to think of strategically through our community safety partnership and youth boards and other children's and public protection ASB services police teams say so actually this pops up every now and again. And um, my first job in the council was um, running. Old Girl Youth Club four nights a week 10 years ago. We then closed down all um, youth clubs within the East Riding. And 10 years later, we're having issues popping back up. Um, as Derek um, mentioned, our, our formal youth provisions, physical youth provisions, the way forward. Actually, young people don't always attend them anymore. We need to think a bit more out of the box. So we need to look at stuff like esports. Um, we need to look at estates like Beverly Leisure Centre for, for this project, for example. Their, uh, their manager there has offered spaces and use of facilities because it's quite community minded. It's that partnership driven approach um, to, to solutions. So the project we've got going in Beverly um, has its challenging elements, um, but it is to offer us a look at what we can do when we bring groups together and talk and work and, and try and uh, use funding in a smarter way. That's brilliant. Thanks very much indeed. In, in terms of, I know we've got later on the agenda a, a plan to look at, at, at issues over a period of time. Would it be worth us actually looking at that and seeing how that pans out and look at the use of funding? I don't know if it's already there, because then we can we can start to identify what works and what doesn't work and see if we can support you even more. 
Yes, I think I would, um, as a community safety partnership, we would like to contribute to any of those discussions. Um, I've been in my post for just over a year now. It's something I've really wanted to push on around young people because it has that clear link to antisocial behaviour and also a precursor to serious violence as well. So we're talking later in the year about the Violence Prevention Partnership. It's actually the, the lead in some of the more serious violence we see in communities as well. So, um, yeah, we're definitely, definitely welcome that. Thank you. Thank you. Can you, Mick, you want to answer a question? Yeah, it's about the um, fairway process. If you look at the graph, the fairway one interventions has been falling the last three years, but the fairway two has actually gone up only slightly, but gone up. Can you say the reason for that? Is it an anomaly or is there a specific reason for that or a certain kind of antisocial behaviour? Yes, thank you. Uh, as you say, the, the number of fairway Fairway first intervention letters has reduced. Uh, I, I recently, uh, well, in fact, this morning, finished a, a training program with officers from the patrol team within Beverly and wider within Humberside Police to, you know, to encourage further take up. And I know working with colleagues from the police, Chief Inspector Glansfield and others, um, we are looking to in increase the number of referrals which come into us. Uh, the number of fairway twos. I think it reflects a couple of targeted groups of individuals who have caused a problem over the past couple of years, and they are repeats. Uh, and again, it, I think when you look at Fairway 2, some of those have moved on to other interventions too, and some of them are actually receiving support from our youth justice services at the moment. There has been a particular cohort, but I mentioned the targeted interventions, and that's where we're looking at with those. They, they have got to that, and we have mechanisms in place to identify them and then put that intervention in. Okay, I'll just come on to Andrew before I bring you in, Peter, okay. Thank you, Chair, and it was just to pick up on um, the earlier conversation around sort of um, youth provision. And I think one thing that we've just got to be really mindful of, and we are with our work with the voluntary sector, is making sure that we're speaking to young people and children about what are the activities that they want to see. And I think it's the comment the police made earlier, you know, it might not be a physical, uh, you know, youth club as we might have had years ago. It's what's appropriate. So there is a lot of work that we do with our voluntary sector partners to hear from children and young people about what it is that they would want to see. So I just wanted to, you know, in terms of when we look at how we allocate funding, that's a really important um, element for us. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Angela. Uh, Peter, please. Yeah, thanks very much for that, Angela. But uh, following on from that, what we all have to be mindful sat around here this morning is we do have a cabinet member in Councillor Hammond present, and I would like to ask him what is he going to be doing over the next um, six months to try and get more funding from our very selves um, for the very um, um, reasons that's been put out this morning. £95,000 isn't much, but thank you very much. It is a lot. Um, looking at it county-wide, we, we need to really address these issues because it's not just Beverly-based, it's county-wide. So whilst we've got the presence of a Cabinet member present, I would like to ask you, uh, Councillor Hammond, what are you going to do about it? And could you report back to the next meeting with some answers, please? Thank you, Councillor. I think just, just following on from Angela's comments, I think what's absolutely key here, and definitely from my experience in my own ward, is that we don't look at two regimented approaches to helping our young people do activities they want to do. Uh, in Market Wheaton, we have actually set up a new youth club, which has been a real benefit to children in the town, but it's not the children who have been perceived to be causing antisocial, antisocial behaviour issues in the town. In fact, when the youth group have gone out to try and encourage them to come along, they've been very clear they don't. that's not what they're interested in. So I think we need a real balanced and flexible approach to this. And actually, working with Humberside Police in Market Wheaton, some good innovative schemes have been fought up to help get those, those young people involved um, in, in something productive, such as... Um, uh, uh, the PCSO wants to do a scheme with bikes, mechanicals, get them trained up with skills and stuff. Which I think it's a real positive thing. So we need to be quite innovative in our schemes. Talking of funding, actually, in my first director's briefing with Andrew, I think the one of the first things I said is I want to always know as a cabinet member how I can help the teams under my portfolio get more money 
both from central government and through our own budget process, which of course all members can feed into. And I would be absolutely delighted and I will be pushing as the portfolio holder for public protection and communities for more funding for the teams under me as part of our budget process. Obviously it's up to all of us to decide that um, when it comes to budget setting, but absolutely it's top priority for me is to get more money in the services that are under my portfolio to help deliver an improvement for our residents. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Armand. Yes, Peter. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councillor Armand, for that, and I will keep you to that. And uh, uh, before before the end of the year, I'm looking forward to more funding streams and um, a, a nice Christmas present from you. Anybody else got any more questions for Angel? Have you finished on your your side, Angel? Sorry, Paul. Uh, no problem. I, I think just, just following up on the question, it, it was it was asking for a report back on what's actually happening, not just the funding. So I think what's really important is we've got some innovative ideas it, it, to find out what they are and to find out how the funding's matching that. Um, so it's it's a it's a more detailed approach than just saying this is what's happening, this yeah. is the money that's coming in. We're all aware we've just kind of hit a hundred percent of debt GDP ratio in the UK, so there's not a lot of money out there at the moment. Um, but, so we've got to make sure we're very careful how we target it, but also what we're doing. And I think that to be a critical friend as we are uh, in this committee is, is to ask that question. Yeah, no, absolutely. And this is just my personal opinion, but I do think in this country particularly, we have a habit of just throwing money at issues and actually not looking in detail at how we can spend that money most effectively. So I'm sure between us all, we can get regular briefing notes to the committee about projects going on. Obviously, you've already got your work programme for this year in place, but through briefing notes, I'm sure we can look at doing that. That's great, thank you. Are we everybody happy with that, Angela, you finished with your? Thank you very much. Thanks, well, the possible recommendations I'm gonna make is that I have to thank Angela, Matthew, David, and uh, Nigel for your updates. Very, very uh, in, impressive uh, going forward. I like it a lot. Um, the, late, the latest community safety partnership strategy to be made available to the members of the Safety and Stronger Oversee Scrutiny Committee. And the last but not least, is a, we have a, a brief update on the Community Safety Partnership and a strategy to be added to the Safety and Stronger Communities Work Programme for 24-25, which I think will come through naturally anyway, in that respect. Has anybody got any last minute? No? Fine. Thank you very much indeed for that brief, and I uh, look forward to the next one. Community Safety Partnership. And I think we are going for an official, an official 10 minute break. Oh, five minutes, five minutes. Get a fresh cup of tea.
So that's all that was. But I'll go through that. Then. Okay, we're going back online. Just, just let me check me out, watch the and then we'll be ready. Be good. Interesting. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, if we're all available. Can I remember, remind uh, councillors that after this particular session, stay behind, please, because Liz here has some work for us to do. So thank you very much indeed. We're under structures tonight. Okay. I would like to now to bring into point of view on the review of terms and tenancy of agreements for council dwellings. And is that over to you, Angela? Uh, thank you, thank Chair. You, it's me again to introduce. It's not actually my portfolio, so I'm subbing in Council McMaster's absence. He's look, lucky him is in South Africa currently, which I'm very, very jealous of. Um, I think generally, Chair, that the report's pretty straightforward and black and white, so I'm going to hand straight over to the officers really for questions, I think. Um, Chair and Committee, just, just by way of very brief introduction, we are going to say um, a few words, but as Councillor Hammond says, hopefully it is, uh, it is straightforward and, and we can focus mostly on any questions that that you've got. Um, I want to say that this report is with the um, with the committee today en route um, to Cabinet, um, where we would look to um, seek Cabinet's approval, and then we're required to undertake some statutory consultation and notification with, with our tenants um, before um, the new tenancy agreement would, would uh, come into place. But what we were proposing to do is just give a really brief overview. When the scope was set for this item, there were um, two or three areas that um, the subcommittee asked that we, we did provide some information on, so we'll cover that. And just to say, we've got our colleague, Wendy Berry, from the Revenues and Benefits um, team also with us, um, so that hopefully between us, we'll be able to respond to any questions that you've got. So I'll hand over to Jeff Mann um, to just give that brief overview. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. I'm pleased to bring this report to, to the committee. As Councillor Hammond and Angela have mentioned, um, hopefully you've had a chance to read the report, uh, so I won't go into it in too much detail. Uh, just to say that um, it was last reviewed in 2007, so that's a, a good long while ago, so it's right to review it. And I think that just to put it in context in terms of obviously the sort of tragic Grenfell fire. So we're looking at, um, you know, health and safety and safety for our tenants and residents and leaseholders. So that's part of the context, really. Um, we have done widespread, widespread consultation with all secure tenants of East Riding Council and the housing review panel as well, uh, which is made up of tenants. And we've also, uh, in conjunction with the Council of Legal Services, we've uh, reviewed all um, tenants' co comments and uh, either uh, accepted those or um, not. And we put our comments into 2.3 of all the comments made by tenants. So we I put we, we put some commentary about, you know, some some were just general comments, some were not in in, in relation to the tenancy agreement. Um, so I'm sure members will understand if we go out for consultation, sometimes we'll get feedback that's not specifically about the tenancy agreement, but about other issues. But we are picking up all those other issues as well. Uh, some of them are about communication, as you can see. As uh, as the report indicates in 1.3, um, we've done a widespread consultation with uh, customers. Um, I think that if, if, if you can see 1.4, um, you know, in, in relation to our tenancies, we've got 11,400 approximately tenancies. We only had 296 returns uh, from tenants. I, I think in, in all honesty, we weren't expecting a number because it's in some ways quite a dry subject. Um, so, uh, you know, people are satisfied with the tenancy agreement. It's quite a technical document, but very important document. Um, so it outlines our responsibilities as a landlord, and our tenants' responsibilities are tenants. Um, as I mentioned, um, you know, feedback from consultation, we've been through all this feedback, we've talked to our legal colleagues as well, uh, and we think we've got a robust uh, revised tenancy agreement fit for uh, 2023 and onwards, because I think it's important that we, we future-proof it as well. In terms of the uh, scope that was set, uh, you know, a few months ago from the 
committee talking in relation to sort of 2.4 to 2.8. Um, there was a, a, a conversation in the scope in terms of antisocial behaviour and the committee wanted to make sure that what we had in our tenancy agreement um, fitted with, um, you know, how we can manage antisocial behaviour uh, and it fits into the, the, the previous agenda items. And I think that from a housing perspective and from a legal perspective, we think that we've got sufficient clauses in uh, the tenancy agreement to manage those uh, antisocial behaviours and support uh, um, victims as well as uh, managing and, and uh, responding to uh, perpetrators as well. And also there was another one about um, the, the, the obligations, responsibilities of, of, of tenants as well. They, you know, the committee wants to make sure that uh, that was clear within the tenancy agreement as well. Um, I think in terms of, um, you know, as I said before, I think we, we think it's will equip the council going forward. Um, and I think it is about ensuring that we provide an effective housing management and maintenance service. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, we, we want uh, obviously to uh, have any questions from the, the committee now. Uh, and appendix one shows the changes in red that we're proposing. And as Angela said, subject to uh, feedback from this committee, it will be going through to cabinet for uh, sign off. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Jeff. And I must admit, I've read this about three times, right at the beginning when I first came on the job because of dealing with tenants quite a bit. Um, I've only got two points to pick up. I'm not very good at uh, reading English literature, but uh, 310 water rates. I think the uh, the letter there has got, oh, should be a two, just because I, I saw it and it's not very much my tendency to argue. And on 5.3 about um, on the property, uh, could we introduce charging of batteries in there of any description, regardless to e-scooters or mobility scooters. Um, we've got some flammaties and things like that. Um, if that's feasible, please. You must not store dangerous, offensive and flammable materials in the property or charge, charging of batteries, which is a, which we know the press the other day, there was a fire. They're just trying to do everything we can to alleviate our problems. And the other one I was looking at, and I read it, and uh, it's become very more apparent today but the advent of people taking on their own tendency is antisocial behaviour and intimidation by in, uh, residents within the block. People turn around and think they own the block and they because they're bullies and that one. So I've come across a little bit of that lately. Uh, I don't know if anybody else in the, the council have had problems with people like that. But that's just two things I was willing to put to the floor. I think you want a question to you, my no, dear. Peter, you want a question now? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I welcome the report, Jeff. Um, um, but a couple of points. Um, it refers to uh, in your um, document, the survey that you put out um, and feedback. Um, you say that you've got a stock of 11,000 plus houses, properties, um, and you only had 200 and odd um, 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 returns. Um, and I take your point, that's maybe because the majority are happy with the um, tenancy agreements. Um, but how are you going to enforce this um, that you've got um, uh, proposals with the tenancy? Um, how is that going to be enforced? Um, I personally know who my housing officer is, but I doubt whether anybody else does unless they have had um, dealings with them. Um, so I would like to suggest, um, along running in tandem with this um, new tenancy agreement, that possibly you get your housing officers to make themselves familiar with the tenants. I think that would be a good start, and then you would get then you would get a positive feedback. Um, uh, from the tenant. Um, and then going on from what um, the chair said about batteries, I do know that um, it is a burner contention with you. 
about um, communal areas. How are you going to tackle the communal areas where you've got flats um, um, that are fire hazards, etc.? And again, does that come back down from visits by the housing officers? Thank you. Chair, if I can um, pick up those questions initially and then hand over hand over to Jeff. But um, Councillor Vassell, I think your point around the housing officers really understanding their patches, their community, and, and working with their residences and the tenants is, is really important. Um, it's something that I've been really um, sort of stressing since I've been in post. I've been in post about eight months now. That for me is is really important. It's something that I know that Jeff and the team are working towards so people know who they they contact who the first point of contact is because this is you know this is a the tenancy agreement is is just a document it's a piece of paper until we're actually able to make sure that we um we can take appropriate action when when people raise concerns with us and um you know certainly the points you raised are, are very valid so that's something that we will be we will be working towards and I think the same thing applies to your second point around communal areas and making sure that we're keeping our blocks safe again it's about our housing officers and our housing maintenance colleagues knowing the blocks and taking action where we where we see issues that we need to deal with Humberside Fire and Rescue are very keen on this already and obviously with the tragic um death that took place in Cambridge last week. Again, Jeff and I are looking at what we can do to make sure we're raising awareness, because obviously that was in somebody's flat. It wasn't even in a communal area, we understand. So share the concerns that you're raising there, but I'll hand over to Jeff for any more specifics you might want to raise. Okay, uh, thanks for that, Angela. Um, uh, thanks for the question, Councillor. Um, in relation to um, you know what Angela's just said, just to uh, emphasize a couple of things really, um, awareness of um, you know um, councillors and um, residents knowing who their housing officer is um, I agree with that totally um, and therefore you know what we've implemented in the last couple of years since I've been in post is that um, you know the responsibility for um, resident engagement resident influence now sits with the area management teams so we are monitoring the activity of that and um, you know, reports will go to my leadership team to look at all the areas across East Riding about how uh, residents are engaging, whether they're engaging at the levels they want to engage, et cetera, et cetera. Taking the point also about um, you know our housing officers um, being visible in the community, I agree totally. And you know, we want housing officers to engage with local ward councillors, local residents as to how. Residents want to be engaged with, so is it, is it through coffee mornings, is it state walkabouts, et cetera, et cetera. In terms of the communal areas, um, we've introduced uh, um, a quarterly inspection by the housing officers for each block, um, and they should be inviting uh, local ward councillors and local residents to that if they want to attend or not. Um, so that should be on, on the, um, you know, that should be there as well. In terms of the ASB, you mentioned about intimidation by other residents. I totally agree that um, you know it's an area that, uh, like we talked about earlier on, it is about um, gathering that intelligence data information. If there are breaches of tenancy, uh, we have enforcement powers through the tenancy agreement, and you know ultimately it is about possession and eviction of uh, antisocial behaviour tenants. Um, you know, obviously uh, we would have to convince our legal team. And also the the judge, if we want to go down that route. Uh, but you know we are prepared to do that if if it's necessary, if we've got the necessary evidence and information to support that case. Um, in relation to the specifics that the chair raised, um, I think in terms of the the water charges, I think that's a an element where we used to um, recover water charges as a local authority. But uh, the the understanding now is that people pay that direct to the uh, utility companies that's why we're suggesting removing it from the tenants agreements it's no longer relevant um so i think it, hopefully that answers the questions that have been put so far okay i'll, I'll bring a question in uh, it's an active one but i won't bring any back drills peter mentioned your housing officer which is excellent um so the scenario is you've got a block of four 
and the housing office has been around and he's given somebody permission to have uh, an outside shed put up for the mobility scooter. Um, and where the person put the shed is kicked off with the other residents, they don't want it there. Um, then when I spoke to the particular officer involved um, about, did you let the other tenants know that this in this communal area, which is out of the way, can't be seen from the front, did you let anybody know that this was going to happen other than these guys just turned up and threw some slabs down? And there's indications where there was not necessarily the policy of the housing department to inform the tenants in the block of a menial changes, i.e. increase of dustbins, people think, putting things out. Just an antisocial behaviour kicked off on this aspect. And uh, I got caught up on it. But the other one is, and again, it's something that it's on the cards, is that moving people into a, the, the property with uh, uncontrolled animals. I don't, and I say one, because they're only allowed one anyway. And that's another instance. So once again, the same housing officer, I have to be honest, because it would be my area. Um, I don't know if that housing officer made liaisons with people within, which might come back to what Peter was saying. If the housing officer liaise, it might help. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And I'll just um, say a few words before, before I hand over to Jeff again. And I think, um, you know, we can talk generally about sort of the approach we could take if that's if that's helpful um, and, and how we would want to address concerns like this and I guess how the tenancy agreement supports us um, in, in that approach. So rather than getting into, into specifics, I'll ask Jeff just to talk about what our approach um, would, would be. Thank you. So uh, I think, uh, thank you, Chair, for that. I think that uh, a, lot of that of lot, a lot of that relates to communication. Uh, and I think that obviously, as I just said, happy to speak outside uh, and, and pick up those specifics. I think in terms of um, information to new tenants uh, and the messages we get out uh, to them and, and vice versa, um, we are working on that currently at the moment. So we're looking at, um, you know, what information we provide uh, in terms of uh, a viewing stage when we show people around the property, in terms of sign up when we actually sign them up. And then we're now introducing a new tenant visit as well after uh, four weeks of people moving in. So we're doing that and we started that in July. I, you know, so, so we are working on that. Uh, the information that uh, we're going to give out to um, uh, new tenants will be reviewed by the housing review panel because we think that's important that people understand it. We are looking at looking at electronic as well because we are looking at, you know, and we're going to ask people whether they want it manually or electronically or a combination of both so that they've got that option. Um, and, so, and that, so those key messages will talk about, you know, conditions of tenancy and your obligations as a tenant and our obligations as a landlord. So we will be talking about the communal areas. We will talk, be talking about animals. We will be talking about ASB. We will be talking about payment of rent. And we want to do that at right at the right stages of the of the new tenant process because that's where our captive audience is. Uh, in relation to mobility scooters in general, uh, we're doing a lot of work, uh, and you know I'm, I'm I'm leading on that with some colleagues in housing services and you know other colleagues in in the wider council as well. Um, and I think it is about yes, we should be consulting with um, the people who are living there before we put anything up. So there will be two consultations if I can put it like initial consultation about is it feasible uh, and do residents support it uh, whether it's mobility scooters or you know uh, storage for bikes etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, and then we'll do a more detailed feasibility study as to the practicalities because we might have to dig in underground and you know the services and things like that and then we will go back and say yes it is feasible this is what the time scale is so um there will be a proper consultation, proper, uh, and yes, I wouldn't expect us to just go along and put up a structure without uh, reference to the residents living there. Yes, please, Gareth. Um, I know you're kind of covering this, but it's it's that I suppose that process of informing people of why why we're looking at batteries. There was a uh, an article on Reddit for this week, very very clear um, uh, about a, a pressure group that had been trying to get the information out nationally. Uh, in terms of the issue with batteries and, and the concern that they have, uh, and the report on the number of deaths, the number of fires that have been caused, 
Um, and I suppose in a way it's, it's informing people. I suppose my, my concern is if you've got a 2% a, a, a return rate on your consultation for attend something as important as a tenancy agreement, um, it's whether that information would actually find the right eyes, let's say. Um, I, I think just to clarify uh, is that, yes, you're right, health and safety, safety of residents is, is, is key. Um, and we, we do have a, a homey in, uh, which is our magazine that goes out twice yearly to all our residents. Um, and, um, you know, there will, there will be some health and safety guidance in that. But it's it's all, always that conversation on an ongoing basis uh, with us and, you know, the residents about safety. Uh, so not just relying on documentation, it's that ongoing dialogue. Uh, you know, we have our obligations uh, compliance wise for gas, electric safety as well. So, you know, there's a whole raft of things that we are looking at in terms of our making sure our residents are safe. Uh, yes, please. I think you may be on the same wavelength as me, but carry on. Well, I was just going to pick up some specifics around sort of storage in communal areas and I suppose just to try and give a you know, further reassurance that we have written out to tenants, we've made it really clear that items shouldn't be stored in, in communal areas and the dangers that are associated some of the points um, Councillor Shepherd was making. Um, it is still an issue that we have to ask people to move things in. As Jeff was saying earlier, we're looking at the options that we've got. We've got, just as an example, 43 blocks where we need to ensure that we've got appropriate sites for either mobility scooters and or bikes. And the, the, the same solution will suit all of those sites. So we're looking at what we need to do. And that's where the consultation, as Jeff uh, mentioned, comes in. You know, these, these blocks weren't built with appropriate arrangements in place and we're sort of having to retrofit and it will be different for different sites. But I suppose I just wanted to reassure this committee that it's an absolute priority for us. We're making sure that commu uh, communal areas are kept free at the moment, but also looking at alternative arrangements because we know that mobility schools is a vital for a lot of our tenants we know we need um, an appropriate response for them as well so just to try and reassure um, members i think it is a night a nightmare on that respect i'm just going to move on to a question which i think wendy might be here for this is the cost of living non-payment of rent and signed posts and tenants and that is that something that you're here for wendy the question is people who run out of of money, this, that, and the other, how do you go about helping them? Okay, um, thank you for the question. We have um, a Your Money team, which we've got nine um, members of staff, and their job is to try and um, communicate with all our residents, not just tenants, but anybody that is struggling. So this will they look to help to maximise their income, maximise their benefits. Um, they will also do budgeting help. So they'll look to try and help looking at what the current income is and what their spend is and how they can best advise them on that. And also on debt advice as well. So they'll try and help them make sustainable arrangements for their rent or their council tax. We do that whether it's over the telephone or face-to-face -face or um, whether that's in their homes or the customer service centres. Our housing colleagues have contact with your money, so they'll refer them as soon as, as possible. A lot of our um, rent recovery notices have signposting on, which will, for their own self-help, so they can signpost them to the web where they can go and have a look at their... And then there's an entitlement calculator on there so that they can put in their own details and it'll tell them if there's any extra benefits that they could claim if they if they want to self-serve rather than because not everybody wants to talk to somebody so we, we cover both angles really so um and then there's budgeting tool on there as well for them if they want to self-serve so we are reviewing our documentation that goes out all of the time and even when people email in the standard email response we're looking at that to make sure that the sound posting is, is on there to try and help them because we're obviously very aware of the economic climate and that people are, are struggling really um i don't know does that cover everything <laughs> thanks very much wendy has anybody got any questions i do have another one what's your percentage
what's the percentage of your tenants struggling with the, the financial crisis we've got at the moment? So we as councillors have an idea what's going on. I haven't actually got any stats with me currently, um, but I can certainly provide them. I can. Uh... Right. Could I could I just ask uh, to what state does somebody need to be in, or be how far behind do they need to be before they're sort of shown a door? And do we, as an authority, um, show any level of compassion, given obviously the dire situation that the economy's in at the moment? Um, most definitely, we, we we try and communicate um, from day one, really, from when the tenants get the tenancy. We're we're now engaging to see whether the to help them do like um, we're looking to see whether we can do an affordability study on them before they take on the tenancy. So the sooner we can engage, the sooner we can help. Um, I'm very mindful that the the cost to the authority for somebody to be made homeless is counterproductive. So the more help we can put in at an early stage, then we certainly work together across the, the sections to try and help our tenants. Yes, please, Jeff. I was just going to add to what Wendy said. Um, yes, we, we, we look at every individual circumstances, you know, we look at their vulnerabilities uh, and we, 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 we are compassionate as a, a, a local authority in terms, and it is a last resort, uh, evicting someone. As Wendy says, um, if we evict someone, uh, then the, the, there is potential cost to, to the council, whether it's children's, adults, housing services, um, because, you know, it's about whether they come back through the system uh, and ask for rehousing again. So we, we work very closely with um, colleagues in in, in Wendy's team, we've got very closely with adults and children, so that this is the last resort, because um, so we know that it's not a, a solution, really. It, it, it's, a, you know, it, it's one that we want to avoid if we can. Okay, before I divert away from that particular department, has anybody got any more questions for... No, nope. I'll move over to Barbara. <clears throat> Angela. I draw your attention to point nine three under gardens. How far do the, does the council go to providing written permission for the erection of uh, greenhouses and sheds, pot plants um, uh, and shrubs and, and hedges, fences, things like that for one individual tenant? How much would that individual tenant be allowed to erect? <laughs> Thank you for the question, Councillor, and um, I'll give a, a very general view and then Jeff may have some examples or, or give a bit more detail. But I think it depends on the circumstances and what's appropriate and what space is available and what's around. So um, we would, whilst being consistent in our approach, we would also need to reflect the particular circumstances of the case and what was appropriate. But I'll hand over to Jeff and he might be able to give a little bit more detail on, on that point. Thank you. Thanks for that, Councillor. Um, I think that, um, you know, we, we will look at each case on its merits uh, and, you know, we, we, we do ask for uh, people to write in and, uh, you know, tenants to write in and, and, and seek permission. Um, I, I'm sure we've all got cases or understanding where some people don't, so we have to enforce or we have to have that conversation afterwards with people that put up structures and things like that. So I think happy to speaking more detail in, in, in relation to if you've got any individual cases outside the meeting. Uh, but I think that, you know, we want to work with our tenants. We want to build those relationships up, to, you know, so it is about that communication, as we mentioned before, that it's, you know, enforcement is, you know, not a good solution really, because obviously, it, it, you know, so I think it's about that communication. Uh, and, you know, we, we have to give reasonable permission, so we can't hold, back without a, a, a good cause to say no so and we can get challenged um and you know we do get challenged so we have to be reasonable about our, our, our saying no or saying yes and sometimes we'll put conditions on uh the permissions so you know how big it is where it is etc cetera, etc cetera. is it a temporary structure is it a permanent structure um you know and you know we will make those conditions clear uh if we are going to agree and put that in writing as well. 
Okay, Peter Astle, please. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, Jeff, um, on the whole, um, I would like to think the East Riding of Yorkshire Council is one of the better authorities when it comes to um, tenants, um, um, looking after the tenants. Um, and I agree that um, storage of um, equipment in communal areas, especially um, mobility scooters and push bikes. And I agree with Angela, these properties were designed originally um, for the modern day um, to th uh, 2023 um, things that are taking place. Um, and we do have an aging population as well. And a lot of a lot of the um, older end um, of the age range are in some of these properties. Um, I would like to to think, Jeff, that um, we as a local authority, it's paramount that we that we don't allow tenants to keep things in the communal areas, but. As a local authority, I would like to think that there was some sort of funding that would be available to help these tenants, um, especially with mobility scooters. Um, and um, I do think um, it's paramount that these um, communal entranceways are free from um, obstruction because as a member of the fire authority, I also have an interest from that angle as well. I would like to think that the firefighters was going in and before they could get to rescue um, the the tenant, God forbid, they were tripping up over mobility scooters, et cetera. Um, and going back to um going back to the other thing about um property um and and the landlord shall maintain um, the property. Are you 100% happy, um, bearing in mind I'm a tenant myself, and I do get it down the neck from other tenants, are you 100% happy with the contractors that are carrying out your works? If not, what are you gonna do about them, please? Thank you. Chair, I'll... I'll respond initially and then um, as is the pattern hand over to Jeff for the for the better answer but um, I think just going back to the issue of communal areas um, as, as you said Council Astle, Humberside Fire and Rescue they have a zero tolerance approach to anything in a communal area and it's our job as the landlord to try and make sure that that happens and in terms of investment um, we are looking at what arrangements whether that's a structure outside what it might be for a particular site to make sure there are appropriate arrangements you know slightly broader you'll know that we've got for our sheltered housing schemes we're remodeling those and as part of that we'll make sure we've got appropriate provision so that's so there is investment and funding to make sure we've got um, an appropriate response um, in respect of um, our contractor arrangements, we do have robust arrangements. We hold our contractors to account with regular meetings through the housing maintenance unit um, team. But I'll let Jeff just say a little bit more about how that happens in practice. Thank you. Thanks, Angela. So in relation to the community areas, as I say, we've got a, a robust inspection regime in place. Um, I think in terms of, um, you know, being open and honest with the um committee that uh, you know the, the enforcement of communal areas in in terms of having them clear is work ongoing with residents so that we we get them on board uh because it's important that it's not just about enforcement it's about under residents understanding the reasons why we're doing it for, for their own safety and for the safety of neighbors um i think that uh it, we can talk also about the, the fire safety policy that's going through at the moment in terms of um, ratification. So that will have a, a, a zero tolerance uh, policy as well for, for communal areas. Um, so that will help officers, um, you know, have that conversation with residents. Because I think, you know, at the moment, you know, they, they, it's a, a conversation and then obviously perhaps some more conversations because we want to work with our residents in terms of what, um, Angela says about the the contractors. Um, yes, we want to, we want all our contractors external to to provide a a good service 
um, and we do monitor them. We have regular mon uh, meetings with them uh, to to review their progress and performance. Uh, and uh, you know, we will hold them to account. We go through them with them about the complaints they've had, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, and their time scales. So, you know, I think there's always room for improvement. But I think that you know, we we welcome feedback from members about you know contractor performance if if you've got any from your constituents uh because we you know we want to improve our services of course we do in terms of time scale and performance um so um you know i think uh i could go on but i think um i, I won't i'd like to thank you both very very much and come to close the meeting and possible recommendations i thank you both and to your team and for wendy for turning up it's nice to hear from a different voice um the council tenants be reminded annually through its housing in mode magazine about the need to ensure the property in case of flood fires etc possibly another recommendation is going forward with the mobility scooters and electric uh, work, uh, bikes and that is that we look at all our old properties by putting an outside stru structure secure that they can put them in there so they're not in the property and supplying power to it uh, on the basis like people pay for the electric cars charging outside in the car park so possibly you know this structure is going to be quite a bit and i'm putting the power out there and people pay by card whichever way you want that that's the only way we're going to really determine the situation in regards to charging these things inside and outside and andrew yes please um, just a suggestion, Chair, if I may, I, I just think that um, the solutions that we'll get at different sites um, might be different and we might be able to provide something internally in some cases. So all I would suggest is if maybe the recommendation could be broad enough so that it's not necessarily just external, there could be different solutions. So that would just be a suggestion from me, please. Thank you. I absolutely agree with the main criteria is that we have mentioned it and we put it down, at least we are looking at as, as a group. So we're not ignoring it. Thank you very much indeed. And I thank you both very much indeed. And you, Wendy, for your attendance, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. And we'll now go off live stream, am I right? Yeah. No. It's really just for you to um, note and receive the work programme at item six. Um, and item seven, four plan of key decision. Uh, it is... Let's have a look. What page in your pack? Page 55 in your pack. And page 56 actually informs you that the fire safety policy for housing has been added to Cabinet's fall plan of key decisions and asks you as a, uh, a subcommittee if you actually want to review this before it goes to Cabinet, which if that is the case, if you want to see it, it will affect which isn't a problem, the officer has informed me um, that it will go to a later date, it'll go to an October cabinet meeting. He's provided an explanation. I don't know whether Angela or Geoffrey want to um, add anything to that as to the importance as to why you may, may perhaps want to see this at the next meeting. I think, Chair, if I may, just, just to say it, it, it fits really well with our conversation on the last item um, and, you know, we'd welcome the opportunity with colleagues um, to, to bring the policy um, as part of the programme. Thank you. Chair. Sorry, sorry. I would move then that the, that the report comes to this committee. Seconder, please. All in favour? Motion carried. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I will now officially close the meeting. Thank you very much indeed.